when my wife and I first got married, we would take seasonal trips down to Florida once or twice a year, mostly for the great weather and also to get a little surfing in. We were both born and raised in California, grew up surfing, but didn't actually meet and get romantically involved until we were both living in the Midwest for work. The closest beach for our kind of recreation was just a hop and a skip away. We didn't have friends or family in Florida, so these trips were literally just for us, to satisfy our beach cravings, our desire for seafood, and even the urge to be out in the sun. Because we didn't have family to visit, we would just randomly select a different coastal town each trip and stay somewhere brand new every time we went down. Being young newlyweds, we weren't making a ton of income and our savings were all but non-existent. We had to be cheap on these road trips, which meant no hotels, period. Not on the journey and not after arriving in whatever town we picked previously. We drove a Subaru that had a decent amount of room in it and we'd save several hundred dollars by just sleeping in it. This was my wife's method of curving our budget and being an outdoorsman my entire life, I was on board from the moment she mentioned camping. My wife, Kat, didn't have traditional camping in mind though. This was the early 2000s, so stealth camping wasn't quite as mainstream as it is now. Kat had heard about stealth camping from a coworker who was a cross country bicyclist. Her coworker explained that while on these incredibly long pedaling trips, Sometimes the only place to get safety and to get some rest is in a parking lot or the green belt between two businesses. Bikers would pack meager supplies, just enough to keep them going, and then supplement those supplies with whatever they could buy on the road. These bikers would carry light sleeping gear, maybe a tent or just a tarp, and rudimentary stuff like sun blinds or can openers to add a touch of convenience. So we start making this part of our Florida trips We'd load up our Subaru with all kinds of odds and ends, things that I imagine Boy Scouts would pack. Toothpicks, lighters, a rope, sandwich bags, and batteries. All the little things that you don't really think about until you need them. Everything would be filed away in a neat little storage space, along with our bedding, to make for a perfect traveling sleep capsule. Cat even had dangling drapes that encircled the back area for privacy. For the better part of four years, we had zero issues with our urban stealth camping. The only problem that we encountered was that many of these coastal towns that we were visiting had pretty good curfews and ordinances, so we couldn't overnight in beach parking lots or in front of stores or businesses of any kind. So we had to find places where people parked on the street. And again, for these small coastal towns in Florida, this wasn't a common occurrence. Everyone had a garage or a driveway, so our little Subaru camper stuck out like a sore thumb. It never failed though. We would always find some little neighborhood or development where people did use the street. We'd blend in for a few days, maybe even a week, then hit the road for home. There were showers and facilities at the beach, all kinds of outdoor amenities. But the simple act of just finding a place to shack up for the night, that always proved to be the most difficult. Camping in plain sight actually takes a little bit more creativity than folks give us credit for. During one particular trip, we were having an impossible time trying to find a place to set up. It was our first night in town, and by this point in the evening, we've been driving in circles through the community for three hours, with absolutely no luck on an inconspicuous place to park. Finally though, after following some windy roads that took us through a more rural neighborhood, we found a little stretch between the beach and some houses where people did park on the road. We pulled in on one end, where the neighborhood stopped and the road snaked off into the dark and called it home. We started on our usual bedtime routines, like brushing our teeth, washing our faces out of the water jug, getting comfy, locking the doors, and snuggling in for bed. There was a commotion outside though, as we heard walking around and a little talking. Soon someone was climbing into the car that was parked nearest to us, maybe 250 feet behind us, far away enough that we weren't really concerned. They fire up the car and roll off down the lane, only to leave us pretty much alone out there on the street. There was now only one other car parked on the roadway, and it was hundreds of feet behind us. I was worried that they'd be leaving any minute now. Getting a ticket wasn't really in our budget. Kat and I discussed our options, but we were kind of trapped. After driving all day, only to drive even more around town, we didn't have it in us to start the car and look for a more populated area. As we were talking though, our prayers were answered. 
from the front windshield, we could see a pair of headlights cut up the road the opposite direction and stop somewhere ahead of us. I climbed up and pulled the curtains back, only to find a big dusty van parked about 75 feet off. The second I saw it though, I got this weird feeling from the bottom of my feet to the top of my throat. Something was off and I let my wife know immediately. She popped up herself, took one look at it and then got back under the covers. She said it was creepy, but we were in the middle of a neighborhood and that was the whole point. We were safe and needed to be incognito, not be suspicious and draw attention to any passing vehicle. She was right and frankly, I admired her for her undaunted courage, but I didn't like the van nor how close it was to us. From my place behind the curtain, I watched someone fire up a cigarette in the driver's seat of the van and proceed to smoke it while looking right at our car. I couldn't do it. I told Kat that I was going to sit watch for a bit because everything was just a little creepy. She said whatever, rolled over, and then promptly passed out. I slithered up into the front seat and got comfy behind the wheel. We were parked against the moon and had a decent tent. I was wearing dark clothing, kind of a perfect storm for not being seen behind the windshield. The whole time I just watched this hand go back and forth with the cherry of the cigarette. No smoke escaped the window, not even a whisper. Anyone smoking with the windows up is a total psycho if you ask me. That being said, my paranoia was now at an all time high, and to this day I've never been so suspicious of a person, but I couldn't let it rest. After 30 or 40 minutes of just staring that van down, I finally decided that I was going to go for the long haul. I'd see the sunrise if I had to, whatever it took to make sure this guy went away. I got the jet boil the percolator, everything I would need to make a quick quiet pot of coffee. I set the whole thing up outside the car, on the ground on the passenger side, so I could stay somewhat hidden from anyone driving by or looking out from their window. I also wanted to force the action. I got tired of watching that van and waiting for something to happen, so I got out and essentially offered a challenge to anyone that wanted to mess with us. Here I am, out in the open, no tricks to be pulled. I watched the night sky, listened to the heat whirring beside me. And then I heard the click and slam of a car door opening and closing. I look over and there's that guy from the van, awkwardly staring at me across that 75 foot gap. And then almost immediately, he starts walking right toward me, one hand in his pocket. He didn't seem panicked or intimidating or anything, just the energy of a man running an errand. I, on the other hand, was low-key tripping out just underneath my skin. This was what I wanted to happen with my open challenge to the world, right? But now, he was coming over. I realized that I bit off a little more than I can chew, and now I was about to choke. I took a deep breath just before he got within earshot, reminded myself that everything was fine. I had a 14-inch Bowie knife laying in the dirt beside me, something my wife and I traveled with everywhere we went. I was going to use it hopefully to scare this guy off at the first sign of trouble and if not, bury it in his chest before he could kill me or my wife. He gets within 25 feet and just stands there. More of that awkward energy. The more the guy does, the more strange that he seems. His hands go in and out of his pockets. He pushes his hair back a few times and then finally comes over within talking distance. He says, hello and ask me how's it going. We share some very brief small talk before he asks me for some matches. The only matches that we had are in the car, but I do have a lighter for the jet boil. So I hand it over and explain that he can just keep it. He seems blown away by this, like he's never received a kinder act of generosity, he continues to thank me over and over again. After a string of thank yous comes to a final end, he goes back to just awkwardly standing there. That's when it occurs to me how big this dude is, six foot two at the very least. He's broad too, a well-built fella, but it was so dark that his dimensions were hard to discern at first. Now that I sized him up, I was a little uncomfortable again. His awkwardness came off his apprehension, like maybe he was about to jump me or something. You better believe that I had that knife tucked in my waistband, just underneath my shirt. It was still in the sheath, so honestly, it would have been a pain to get out and use, but having it close was relieving. I poured two cups of coffee in the disposable throwaway cups that me and my wife used, 
I offered up one to the guy. I told him that I was staying awake for a bit for a photography shot as I was an amateur photographer. This part was actually true, but there wasn't any shot that I was looking for. This was just an up and down lie, short of the being an amateur photographer part. That's about the time that this guy decided to dive into his backstory. The stranger told me his name, something I still don't remember, and that he'd very recently been released from prison. He was moving along the coastline on his way to Miami, where he had a job lined up. I nodded along, more interested than you could believe. I could have easily earned an Academy Award with the performance that I put on. Like, I was this guy's old high school coach, and he was catching me up on his life or something. Honestly, I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying at all. I was all caught up in a panic, letting one hand rest near the knife in my waistband while looking for signs of aggression in his body language. None ever came, but I was still on high alert. I told the guy that I wished him luck and was going to be turning in soon myself. He said thanks again, then milled around the area for a little bit longer before climbing back into his own van. I saw him light another cigarette, just went back to lounging in the van. For whatever reason, continued to stare at us. Red flags and alarms had been going off in my head all night, but here I was, somewhere around two in the morning, and hadn't slept any yet. My interaction with that guy was very creepy, but nothing so scary that I needed to run in the other direction. I convinced myself that he was a guy just down on his luck while I put my coffee supplies away, then slipped into the front seat. I watched the area for a few minutes before deciding to turn in. But just as I turned to climb back into the bed space with Cat, something caught my eye. I saw movement along the vegetation between the road and the beach. A shadow at first, but soon I could make out the undeniable figure of a man, one even larger than the guy that I was just talking to. He skulked along the underbrush until he was level with the van, then crossed in front of it and climbed into the passenger seat. He was very careful with the handle as I couldn't hear it open nor latch when he silently pulled it closed. Guy was going the extra mile to make sure that no one knew that he was out there. Great, not one but two ex-convicts roaming around not 100 feet from where my wife and I are trying to sleep. I slammed the key into the ignition and flooded the area with my high beams. Right there in front of me, I could see both guys sitting in front seats of the van, and they gave me a creepy, rotten grin through the glass. The driver held up the lighter and waved it back and forth at me. My wife asked me what the hell was going on, but I just shifted the car in a drive and whipped around to get deeper into town. The logical thing would have been to blow right past them, so I hadn't been down the stretch of road, and that was literally where they'd come from, but we were definitely more familiar. If I was going to have an advantage, it would be to go where town thickened up and more people could intervene. I'll never forget looking up through my rear view and through the flailing fabrics of the blind, seeing that van peel off the shoulder and come rolling after us. They didn't turn their headlights on, but simply followed along in the dark. I could only see the grill and the headlights by the glow of my red backlights. It was a very haunting visual. I did my best to quickly explain to Kat what the hell was going on, all while she's sliding from wall to wall in the back of the car. I told her that the guy in the van was released from prison this week and had a friend that he didn't mention sneaking around in the dark around our car. As he didn't mention him, I assume his intentions were probably not good. He was likely casing our situation, seeing if we had anything of value, that kind of thing. It only took Kat one peek out of the back window where she saw the glowing silver grill of that van coming up right behind us for her to agree that I made the right call. It was time to get the hell out of there and we had to do it now. Fortunately for us, the neighborhood led right into a well-lit community. Suddenly that dusty piece of shit van wasn't so scary behind us. They actually looked like assholes racing and squealing around. They backed off after barely a quarter of a mile and loop back into the darkness near the beach. I drove us to the nearest pharmacy, parked under a light pole, and did my best to fall asleep. The worst case scenario would be waking up to a ticket, but at that point, I was just lucky to not have been robbed. We lucked out yet again, as Kat and I just snoozed away the morning and woke up without incident. We caught the best lunch that we've ever had in the local surf deli. The cold cuts were unbelievable. 
We didn't see that van again, and frankly, kind of lost interest in stealth camping. It's been hotels and Airbnbs for us ever since. Personally, I've only ever gone stealth camping one time, and it was during a two-day drive between where I was going to college and my hometown. The drive itself was about 20 hours, the drive itself was 20 hours, and the town that was smack dab in the middle of that drive was Moab, Utah. I had never been to Moab, but I guess maybe driven through it once. But I'd heard about it just like we all have, that it's paradise for rock climbers, rock crawlers, off-roaders, and outdoorsmen in general. I grew up hiking and camping, so I was kind of excited to see what the town would have to offer for a passerby. As I was planning this trip, I was trying to keep it as cheap as possible. As I mentioned earlier, I was in college at the time, and this was my first trip home for the holidays. I was kind of feeling everything out in terms of what this trip would cost, so I could properly budget out for the future. My first budget cut would be a hotel room. I was driving my old Jeep Cherokee, and Moab was such an outdoor-friendly community. I figured there would be a plethora of campgrounds in that area. I'd just roll into one for one quick overnight for five or six hours. The day finally came. I packed up my Jeep and hit the road. Everything went exactly to my plan, cutting through the miles until finally, right down at sunset, I got within 10 or 20 miles of Moab. It was so plain out there. No trees or forest from what I could see in the fading sunlight. I didn't worry though. I figured I'd be sleeping in my car anyway. I didn't need trees or forest to do that. By the time I got into Moab though, it was completely dark. I didn't have any idea where to go in terms of camping. This was well before smartphones, so all I had were the Google map printouts which I had used to piece together a rough idea. Soon I had a campground pegged, one just outside of town along the beautiful stretch of the Colorado River. To my memory, it was called Goose Nest Campground, something like two miles east of the town limits. Yes, I'd googled if there were campgrounds, but what I failed to learn was that these were paid for, highly sought after campgrounds. I couldn't just roll into one and use it. The second I did this, I had multiple campers from other units walking me down with flashlights, asking to see a permit or some kind of paperwork, anything saying that I paid to be there. It was probably to keep out the riffraff, and after this happening to me two or three times, I was too spooked to stick around. I didn't feel friendly, and I thought I was ruining a peaceful night for all these campers, not expecting a stranger to come driving through their area. After getting ran out of those campgrounds, I cruised back into Moab, decided I would just sleep in the parking lot, something like a Walmart or a Denny's, where there's a 24-hour bathroom. I didn't really need comfortable living, I just needed basic stuff to get me to morning. I was really banking on sleeping in the middle of nowhere, but my experience thus far had me hesitant to even go off-roading. Who knows what kind of shit I'd come up on out there. There was no luck for me in town either. The place was crawling with crackheads and weirdos. Every parking lot that I investigated had at least one unsavory looking guy, if not five or six of them, shuffling around up to no good. This was not what I had in mind for such a well-known destination. Absolutely defeated, I decided that I would sleep in the middle of nowhere. I got my Jeep back on the highway and rolled maybe three miles south of town and hooked onto the first dirt road that I saw. There was a little cattle guard laid in between some barbed wire fencing, but aside from that, the place was wide open. There were some bluffs that I couldn't see over, so I just decided to park along the little ridge that partially blocked my car. Still very cautious of my surroundings, I decided to drape one of my blankets that I had across the windshield and the front windows to keep unwanted eyes outside of my cab. Then I insulated myself up front, with my legs across the console and butt in the driver's seat, my back against the door, and placed my feet in the passenger seat. It definitely wasn't the most comfy thing ever, but I had a lot of stuff packed in the back. Plus, I wanted to be ready if anything got weird. I got to my spot just in time around 9pm, way later than I originally planned. My new plan was to catch some quick sleep and be up by 4, get myself ready and back in town gas up and then be back on the highway at sunrise around 5 a.m. It was bare minimum, but again, that was all I needed to get through. 
literally basic survival stuff. Something rumbled me awake in the early hours, just before the time that I wanted to be awake. I cracked an eye open, and outside the jeep was a big dirt hauler, some kind of tractor truck. It was idling, and just around the blanket curtain that I put up, I could see a guy looking down at me from the cab. Not a minute later, he rumbled off into the desert, around one of the bluffs, and then disappeared. I didn't put much more thought into it and just tried to go back to sleep. I figured it was some kind of laborer of some kind and this was his pickup route. A truck that size wasn't up to anything spooky. Not but 30 minutes later, I hear banging on the passenger side window. I crack an eye open and check my watch, just shy of when my alarm was going to go off. I assumed that I was about to get shooed off by the police or maybe the forest service, as the timing would line up with the truck that just drove off by earlier. I yanked the blanket down to find an old beater Chevy outside, with a guy staring holes through the glass at me. I started to wave, but before I could, someone bangs on the window directly behind my head. They banged on it so hard that it rattled my teeth, and I slowly began to realize that I'm completely surrounded. I turn, and sure enough, there's another guy that looks a lot like the first. Plain t-shirt, Levi's, boots. They both start hollering for me to get out of the car. For whatever reason, I obliged. I wanted understanding, just to let these guys know that I was just passing through. I meant no harm. This turned out to be a huge mistake on my part. The second that I unlocked the vehicle, the guys yanked both doors open, pulled me out of the car by my arms and my shoulders. Once they had me on the ground, one sat on me while the other went through everything that I had, starting with my glove box. Saying it was a thorough investigation would be an understatement. I watched while this guy turned my front seats upside down, dumped my glove box and console in the dirt, pocketed anything that I had of value, coins, electronics, you name it. I swear I even saw him take my push-in lighter just because it was shiny. I explained to the guy that was holding me down, I'm a college student, I'm from out of town, I didn't mean any trouble, I was just lost and trying to get some sleep before hitting the road again. The guy literally mocked everything that I said repeated it back to me in a stupid voice, he even slapped me a few times, all while laughing. He didn't care who I was or where I was from. After a few more minutes, the sun crested the hills. Everything was lit up. I don't know how, but I could tell that that made these guys nervous. I could hear cars on the highway, which I thought were closer during the night, and now that I could see it, it was a good quarter mile away from the main stretch of road. How these guys had found me, I couldn't really be sure. I thought I'd done a pretty damn good job of hiding out. Eventually, after 10 or 15 minutes of being pinned to the ground, they just took off. They instructed me not to follow them, not to call the police or do anything stupid because if I did, they'd come back and kill me. They were very, very clear about this when they said it to me. Either way, I'd already made up my mind. They didn't really take much from me, mostly just some food and what little cash I had in front with me. After making sure I was okay and intact, I got back in my jeep, went back towards Moab. It took me a bit, but after making a couple of laps, I found the police department, went in and made a report. At first they were pretty dismissive, as I was a college age student, an out of state license and dirty as hell. I probably looked like a crazy vagrant. Only after I explained where this happened did the officers seem to take a little more interest. You said south of town? How far? One of the deputies asked me. I did my best to explain exactly where I pulled off on the road. The deputy turned back to his superiors and they talked for a moment, going over some notes of prior reports. It turned out that the guys that had robbed me had been making trouble around town for a couple of weeks, and most, if not all the reports, were coming from the south side of town. Furthermore, the dirt road that I pulled off on to get some sleep, well, that road led to a pretty big ranching outfit, and I don't mean a dude ranch resort but a real agricultural facility. They even had a mine out there on the property, hence the big Mack truck that rolled by me in the early morning hours. Well, a couple of guys that had been sneaking in and out of the ranch, usually in the middle of the night. They would come in empty-handed, stumble around the property until they turned on some lights or tripped an alarm. Then they would go scurrying back out into the desert with whatever they could grab. Tools, copper, raw ore, building materials, literally anything they could sell into turning a couple of bucks. My misfortune 
turned into a stroke of luck for the local police department. I took them out to where my incident took place, and from there, the sheriff's department was able to track these assholes down by the end of the day. They found them holed up in a little cave in a wash that intersected with the river. They had water storage, a fire pit, all kinds of stuff to give them actually a livable, decent life. The issue is, they all pillaged locals and travelers like me to get it all. Not after that day, I got all my stuff back, which, as I said, wasn't really that much. Maybe $50 total, along with some of my personal stuff like blankets. I have no idea what happened to all those men, but I'm sure the camp was cleaned up, missing items returned to owners, and everything else dumped in the trash. From there, I'm sure those dudes got locked up, and I went about my business. Like I said in the beginning, this was my first and only time stealth camping, and I can confidently tell you, I'll never ever do it again. A few years ago, my wife and I were going to go visit her sister somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. We're an older couple, but not ancient, not even retired, so we make up all trips like this pretty often. Recently though, or at least within the last five years or so, we've been hearing about a new fad called stealth camping. My wife and I thought this was funny, as we'd done this kind of thing for years across many different states and many different cities. I'll admit we were fascinated though. We found all kinds of YouTubers and TikTok streamers, people coming up with new ways to camp in more and more populated areas. Some of the stuff that we were seeing was genius, cutting edge kind of thinking, and some of the other content that we found was very daring, the type of dangerous content that made purely for shock and views. Attempting to camp in crime ridden areas, attempting to camp without a car or a tent, just crazy, ludicrous attempts at getting views. Regardless of it all, we liked what we were seeing, started incorporating this into our cross country trips. We started simple at first, just sleeping in the car in well lit parking lots, then slowly transitioned into more isolated methods of camping. Instead of sleeping in a Walmart parking lot, we'd find a luxury condo, or maybe even a gated community, somewhere with a little more security. We'd follow someone inside, find a nice, non-reserved parking place, and sleep away the night without anyone knowing. Dawn would come and we'd get ourselves ready, roll right out the exit gate as if we'd lived there our whole lives. It was a lot of fun, and always made for some mild excitement. Now, stealth camping isn't quite the same as boondocking, which was something else that my wife and I had done. Boondocking is just breaking camp in the middle of nowhere, generally public land, and that doesn't have services or any amenities. It's essentially just typical camping. We liked to stealth camp because it kept you in town limits, and you didn't actually have to get anything set up. You got to utilize your car in a way that you normally don't get to. Well, after a year of exploring and experimenting in the great fad of stealth camping, we decided to try something new on this trip when we visited my sister-in-law. Instead of just using a car, we are gonna actually find a place within town and city limits to set up a little camp and sleep outdoors. We'd seen enough videos and practiced enough on our own to feel confident we could get away with it. Looking back, I don't know what the hell we were thinking. This was some ultimate bored, middle-aged white people activities if such a thing ever existed. Everything on this trip was going good at first. We stopped three or four nights at this point, all of which were successful outdoor ventures. Now we were actually in the city, we needed to be careful with the place that we chose. After getting some food and stretching out our legs, we started shopping around for a place to set up. It wasn't long before we spotted this quaint little green belt behind a Target store. It had ominous fencing that didn't actually have a warning of any kind. There was grass and a line of trees, even a little hill to offer a vantage point. By and large, it seemed absolutely perfect. It would make for the most high profile stealth camping adventure for us yet. Now, you can't just go in and start setting up full camp with people around. We'd have to make several trips to and from our car, so we wanted the business nearby to be closed, the parking lot to be empty, and a healthy blanket of darkness settled over us. We killed some time, ran some basic errands, made sure we had food and water for the night before returning, and sure enough, the place had emptied out, and we were left to do our business. 
We didn't have a ton of supplies or anything, but we liked to be comfortable and didn't want to have to return to our car for any reason. As I've been saying, we took it pretty seriously, compared every step of our camping to some videos that we'd seen. We knew all of this had to be safe and secret, so we held ourselves to a certain standard. At the end of the day, though, it was a lot of fun and something to tell our friends about. The camp itself was tucked into a thicket of trees about halfway up that hill, which kept our tent out of view from pretty much every direction. It was a dark nylon two-person tent, and so small that it blended in perfectly with the surroundings. Up where the trees were were a little flat area to put the tent, which also had a two-person cot inside. It was very comfortable and kept us off the ground, which did preserve our backs a bit. Again, we're older. You can't blame us for preventing the aches and pains, if able to. We settle into a couple collapsible chairs that we brought along. We spared no luxury with the isolation that we had back there. We talked in hushed voices, shared a snack and had a little wine, and just watched the sky. It was relaxing, very mellow. You almost couldn't tell that we were in the heart of a major metropolitan area. Somewhere behind us we could faintly hear the drone of the highway. But then we heard something much closer, tires squealing through the parking lot. The hill wasn't so high that we couldn't see over the target building, but it was obvious that some kid just whipped in the lot, was doing donuts or something to that effect. Every time that we thought it would stop, they would just cut the wheel and gun it in the other direction. It was very off-putting, but not quite enough to be scared or anything. Our car was parked out there, but there were a few other cars too. Random lot overnighters, maybe even graveyard shift workers. There was a stretch in numbers that hopefully whoever this was would be careful enough not to crash into any of the cars. It quieted down after a while, and soon my wife and I were getting ready for bed. There's something about sitting in the dark, especially outdoors, that just drains my battery. It could be 7 p.m. and I'd tell you it was midnight. I just lose all sense of time and want to be asleep the whole time I'm out there. Just as soon as we're getting ready to break down the chairs and go inside our tent, we hear that same car come ripping through the parking lot once again. Except this time, it comes to a screeching halt. My wife and I look at each other. That's new. Then we hear a car door open and shut. A second one. Then we hear footsteps, voices. Everything is getting louder. My wife and I look at each other in total terror as two strangers pull the fence back and start wandering right into the green belt that we're hiding in. We can hear them clearly now. They aren't talking about anything nice or friendly, mostly violence and drug use. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. My wife starts to get up, but I stopped her, whispered for her to stay put. The trees had us totally blocked from view. The only way that we'd be found was through sound. The less movement, the less likely that we'd be caught. She sat back, put a hand over her mouth and just waited. Thankfully, those voices slowed down as the two strangers stopped short of where we were lingering, down in that flat area before the hill. There was a big fallen tree down there too, bigger around than a car tire, and made for a good bench. I considered camping next to it earlier, but found it too close to the fence for comfort. And thank God that we didn't do that, or we would have been discovered almost immediately. Now we just listened to these guys talk for a while. Obviously, we didn't know their names, so I'll just refer to them as Guy 1 and the Loud Guy. Guy 1 was only a little softer spoken, but talked at such a fast speed that we had a hard time keeping up with him. I'll try to recreate as much of the conversation as I can remember. At first, they were just talking about doing drugs and getting high, partying. But eventually, the talks turned into violence. Stuff they'd done, stuff they wanted to do. And this eventually led them to why they were out there in the first place. Damn, dude, what time is it? Is he even coming or what? The loud guy asked. Yeah, yeah, he said he'd be late. He's always late. Can't wait to do this, guy one said. Yeah, me too, man. Dude's a scumbag, loud guy agreed. Now they start trailing off about how they were supposed to meet a third person, a drug dealer of some kind. They were going to rip him off right back here. Apparently, they would bought from this guy pretty regularly, but his prices went up and his consistency had gone down. Addiction turned to desperation, and both of those turned into anger for loud guy and guy one. Anger that they planned on using to utilize to rob the person that was causing their problems. 
or at least so they reasoned. We definitely didn't like what we were hearing, but our options were limited. We were outgunned against these goons, and we had no interest in running them off or tangling up in any way. I had a gun, naturally, but that was an absolute last resort. It was an unspoken agreement that we could just hide, stay quiet, and wait out whatever the hell was about to happen. The second it was clear, we'd call the police and get the hell out. The two goons kept talking about all kinds of creepy, colorful stuff. My wife ended up covering her ears because it was so gross, beyond locker room talk, but the truly heinous daydreams of the criminally deprived minds. After a while, we heard footsteps approaching from the outside. I prayed for a security guard or someone, but it turned out to be the long-awaited drug dealer. Showtime. They all started exchanging pleasantries, shaking hands. This part actually felt almost cool, as my wife and I were the only ones privy to what was really going on, or at least so we thought. The conversations then turned to business. Loud guy starts to inquire about their purchase, and drug dealer pulls a gun out of his jacket and points it right in Loud Guy's face. What the hell, man? He screams. You didn't say he'd have a gun. There's a lot I didn't tell you, Guy One says. Now empty out your pockets. This whole exchange was a double setup, as Guy One was never going to rob the drug dealer, but was actually in cahoots with him. Then the second gun came out. They shouldered up and Loud Guy immediately realized that he was done for. His only option was to get louder and louder, which for him came pretty easy. They didn't let it happen though. My wife almost gave us up when the drug dealer pistol whipped that loud guy not once, but twice. He got really quiet. Guy one rolled him over, started working him over, checking his pockets, then literally hog tying him. Loud guy started to grumble again. I we thought they were friends. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Guy One took a filthy rag from the culvert ditch and stuffed it inside his mouth. Talk about cold hearted. After that, drug dealer and Guy One went through the contents of Loud Guy's pockets. They even took his shoes and his socks off, where I guess the real haul was found. From what we could hear, they came upon $900 in cash, half an ounce of cocaine, and also had piano wire in his pockets, apparently a tool of his. Then the worst thing that you can imagine happened. My wife's whole body lurched, her eyes went wide, and she let out the loudest sneeze that you can imagine. I froze, totally shocked at what just happened. My first instinct was to say something like, what the hell? But I knew that would only add to the fire that we just started. She put a hand over her mouth and nose and did her best not to breathe. She has wicked allergies in the Pacific Northwest. We had forgotten all about it in the moment, and now it just got us busted. I watched through the trees as all three heads, even the guy tied up on the ground, slowly turned up to look in our position. The drug dealer even briefly pointed the gun up at us. We didn't move. We didn't give up exactly where we were. We knew the hill was dark and shrouded, especially where our tent was. Much to our surprise, the drug dealer and Guy One started to backpedal towards the parking lot. They shouted a few threats, talked some tough guy shtick, and even threw some more shade on Loud Guy, who still tied up on the ground. My wife and I kept still as they slowly disappeared through the fence and around the side of the building. They hopped inside Guy One's car, the squealing menace from earlier, as we realized we never actually heard the drug dealers arrive in a vehicle. We surmised that he must have walked from some nearby location to eliminate loose ends. The car tore out of the parking lot, left us alone in that green belt. Alone, except for Loud Guy, who was aggressively rolling back and forth at the bottom of the hill. We could hear him grunting, struggling to get free, but it was no use. After 20 minutes or so, he finally gave up, panting, face down in the dirt. I honestly think he passed out from exhaustion. My wife and I wasted no time, immediately started breaking down camp. The chairs first, then tucked in all our loose equipment into the cooler, like a big stacked up pile. We took the tent apart as quietly as we could, careful not to step on anything that might give us away. Once that was rolled up, we were ready to break for our car. We heard something though. Loud guy was starting to fight with his bind knees again, except this time he was clearly making some progress. It wasn't more than a few seconds later 
and suddenly his arms were free, which moved down quickly to get his ankles undone. Soon he popped up muttering to himself, brushing the dirt off his clothes. My wife and I were frozen. We had no idea what the hell to do. We were already scared enough at just the prospect of trying to walk by this dude, but now he was up and free. He took one final look around the green belt then bolted for the parking lot. We stood and listened to his fading footfalls until we couldn't hear them anymore, then stood and listened some more. We weren't in much of a rush to get caught by any of these people. It was just by pure luck that none of them had come up the hillside to see who or what we were. Once we were positive that everyone was gone, we huffed all of our stuff out to the car and dialed 911 and hit the road. My wife made a full, thorough report, all except for the fact that we were camping behind Target. The dispatcher assured my wife that lots of calls came out of this part of town. Apparently, we'd been trying to camp in one of the more crime-ridden areas of the city. We'd never heard anything more about the trio of drug-dealing turncoats. And believe it or not, my wife and I continued to stealth camp after that. We just upped our game, like we always do. We do way more research now, as the internet has made it much easier to avoid crazy encounters just like that. That night, we caved and got a hotel just to avoid any further chaos. If you're going to stealth camp, be quiet, be careful, and be prepared for anything. When I was a kid, my dad and his buddy would take me out woodcutting deep in the Montana wilderness. My dad's friend, Uncle Kermit, drove this ancient, dilapidated truck that you could literally see through the floorboards of. The wheel wells were completely rusted out. The exhaust was chewed through and loud as hell. It was an iconic trailer park menace, almost stereotypical for where and when we lived. Dad and Kermit brought me along, not only for my benefit, but under the guise of making me a man. The real reason was they'd have a young, able-bodied, sober hands on site for most of the grunt work. When I was really young, I think nine years old up until about 13, I'd be the log hauler. Dad and Kermit would slog through the area, bust everything up with their saws and axes, and I'd put it all in piles and then take it back to the truck. This made sure the adults could keep moving, keep buzzing logs, and keep drinking beer all without lifting a finger to load the truck. By the time I was older, not only was I a resilient log hauler, but I had to drive too. By the time I could see over the wheel, my dad and Uncle Kermit would take full advantage and really get to drinking. This was in the 1980s, in the middle of nowhere Montana, so as long as the driver wasn't drunk, local deputies didn't really care if I had a license or not. They knew one option was better than the other, so I got more responsibilities out of it. I didn't really mind though, as driving the truck and handling chainsaws felt pretty cool to my teenage self. There was one particular trip where everything seemed to be going wrong. Storm clouds rolled in when there wasn't any forecast for precipitation. Then the truck started acting up, chugging at first in town, and then we realized the transmission itself was completely shot. You could shift through the regular gears, but downshifting was really hard. Shifting into reverse was damn near impossible. It just wouldn't slip. So we're stuck in a rambling old truck that could only go forward at only certain speeds. We were begging for trouble and we'd find plenty of it out there that day. Everything was going per usual. Three of us were spread out about 10 feet, each equipped with a chainsaw and buzzing everything up in sight. I wasn't as quick as the older guys. So add that to the fact that I had to pile up everything. I fell behind really quickly. We were working along a hillside that gently sloped up to my right and then down to my left. This was my least favorite kind of terrain, short of straight uphill, I guess, because gravity worked against me. Anything that got away from me just barreled down the side of the hill, gone until I had to retrieve it. My dad and Uncle Kermit disappeared up ahead, through the brush and then over the hillside. I could still hear their saws though, roaring through all manner of deadfall. It was easy to keep track of each other and the chainsaws made for good security. They were so loud that no predator wanted to get within a quarter of a mile of us. And if they did, well, we're three guys with chainsaws. We weren't really that worried about animals getting the jump on us. I came up on this absolutely massive old oak tree, sprawled out through some still standing pine. 
It was the kind of haul that would take more than one trip with the truck. So I just went to work, turning out the outer limbs into nice logs before turning my saw in the trunk. It was a big, twisty, gnarled tree, so I knew it was going to turn my hands into pudding, running that saw through it. Still, I started turning the trunk into rounds. There were a couple of knots up ahead, but I was on autopilot at this point, just trying to finish the minimal wear to my arms. I set the blade between a couple of the knot holes, hit the trigger, and let the sawdust fill the air around me. I could feel some rot in the wood, empty spaces where the blade passed through much quicker. After the saw padded through, I brought my boot up and kicked the round as to separate it from the rest of the tree, so I could take a better look. This was the worst mistake of my life, as when I bent down to investigate the rot, a whole swarm of bats came screeching out of the hollow. They were beating against my legs, flapping up the inside of my flannel, even tied up in my hair. It was something right out of a movie, and a horrific one at that. I froze up immediately, and had the bats passed over me quicker, I probably would have been fine. I was surrounded though, as I felt myself begin to suffocate on wings and fur everywhere. I turned, and panic set in. I started to stumble backwards. The hill itself sloped down and away, so as I moved backward, I started to fall. As I did that, my hand tried to find something to grab onto, and the only thing within reach was the handle of my chainsaw. I squeezed the trigger, got the blade chain spinning, and then ran the whole saw through my right calf. It was the worst pain I've ever felt, truly blinding, as I felt the teeth pull through my skin, then the fat, and finally, the muscle. Blood erupted as if I tapped a fire hydrant, literally spewing down my leg and spurting through the air like a little sprinkler system. It was spraying out multiple places, so different streams shot in different directions. I imagined my veins and artery chewed to bits, so I figured there would be no way to stop the blood. I collapsed in the underbrush and just laid there for a minute, letting the shock wash over me. Things were bad, but I couldn't tell what the damage was yet. Had I broken something on the fall? It sure felt like it, and my leg was a mess. I checked myself for bites and bats and made sure they were all gone. Next, I checked out my fingers, my arms. My elbow was racked really good, but I couldn't tell if it was broken or not. It was jammed up enough that I couldn't use it to stand back up, though. The chainsaw was laying behind me, idling hard, chained just a few inches from my hip. I reached over and hit the kill switch, then used my good leg to kick it a healthy distance from me. Again, I tried to use my bum arm to get up, but it was completely shot. The brush had enveloped me in such a way that it was almost anchoring me to the ground. So between my bum leg and bum arm, I wasn't going anywhere. The only option was to wait for my dad or Kermit to loop back and find me. This took way longer than I was prepared for. What felt like an hour went by. I couldn't even hear their saws anymore. I figured they were drinking and waiting for me to catch up. I started hollering through the trees, calling for help that I was injured. No holler back. It was late morning at this point. Well, I wasn't worried about overnighting or anything like that, but, but I was aware of how much blood I was losing. More time passed. I couldn't tell you exactly how much. Midday came and went. I was still alone, losing body temp now, and starting to smell my own wound. I was starting to entertain the idea of death when I heard my dad calling out. I quickly shouted back, trying to guide them up the hill to where I was. I could see them through the trees, maybe a quarter mile away. I kept shouting and started shaking near branches to show them exactly where I was. My dad finally got a beat on me, started busting up the hill. When he saw what happened, his face went sheet white and he almost collapsed. He started screaming for Kermit to get up there so they could get me shouldered and carried back to the truck. The old man wasn't as spry as my dad, plus he was completely drunk, so he really had to fight up every step of the hillside. Finally though, he got to me and realized how bad it was. Between the two of them, they slung all three saws and the rest of the gear and my 14 year old self through that forest and back to where we parked. This is where we had to make some hard decisions. Because of where my wound was, I wasn't able to bend my leg, so getting into the cab was not an option. I was going to have to ride in the back of the truck, and someone would probably have to ride with me to keep me from sliding around too much. My dad was a medic in the army in his younger years, so elected to stay in the bed with me and treat my leg as much as he could. That left Kermit to handle the wheel, 
Like I said earlier, he was drunk. Uncle Kermit was drunk the entire time that I knew the guy, literally sun up to sundown, around the clock boozing. Leaving him to drive us down a pretty steep mountain road, through the woods and finally into town was more dangerous than it sounded. The only advantage Kermit had was that he spent the last 60 years living rough and rural out there in Montana. He knew every road, every hairpin like the back of his hand. Not even just the roads, but the terrain and all the changes in between. He could walk from one town to the next, never take a single step off course. His sense of direction was really unbelievable. My dad got me nestled into the back of the bed, near the back window right behind the passenger seat. He cut my pants away and did what he could for my leg, elevated it, wrapped it with clean cloth, and then applied pressure. We didn't have a full first aid kit or anything, so what he could do was pretty limited. Meanwhile, Kermit did his best to get the truck fired up, then did circles until he got turned around and set on the right road home. Remember, we didn't have reverse, so we had to be careful where we pulled in and parked. Then we were off, sailing, navigating that old piece of shit through all manner of mud, muck, and washouts. This wood run was during autumn and in Montana. Fall can get pretty cold. Being in the back of that truck without a coat, I started shivering not long into the drive. My dad did what he could to bundle me up, but with the wound, my body was just shot. I needed to be inside and getting treated. Every bump sent me into hysterics from the pain, and fresh blood would start gushing out all over that dingy metal of the back of the truck. When it started to pool so much that it was filling the grooves in the bed, my dad really set to work on it again. This time, he had much better luck, as whatever he did stopped the bleeding up much more effectively. It hurt like hell, but it had my leg plugged up for the time being, as long as I didn't move too much. Things almost seemed like they were going well for just a moment, until suddenly, the entire truck just veered off the road. We're blasting through a ditch, lopsided as hell, with branches clawing at our faces. The bumping turned into bouncing. Every rock and divot sent my dad and I literally flying in the air. Kermit pulled out, got it corrected, and kept rocketing down the mountainside. That was another factor with Uncle Kermit. The truck was his, but he very rarely drove it. The old man drank so much alcohol that he sometimes would just straight up fall asleep, even if he was behind the wheel. There was probably a more legitimate medical diagnosis for this because he would literally pass out with a moment's notice. You could be talking with him, middle of the day. His eyes would be closed and he'd start snoozing right there in front of you, standing up and everything. It was kind of hilarious and always a sight to see. With that being said though, it was a danger on the road. Anyone who was friends with Kermit knew that driving with him was a fool's errand. Either you had to be the one to drive, or you had to be alert enough to shake that old man awake the second he would fall asleep. That just became our new top priority, even above the fatal gash in my leg. If we crash the truck, everybody dies, not just me. I saddled up so I had both elbows hanging out of the bed, kind of wedging myself in place but also had my left palm ready to bang on the driver's side window if he fell asleep again. My dad was by my legs, trying to keep them still, but also perched and ready to pounce against the glass the second Uncle Kermit nods off once more. It was hairy, scary, and everything in between, man. Being a kid, I actually felt guilty more than anything back there, like I put us in that situation. I felt at fault for putting us all in danger, so I wanted to do as much as I could to help avoid it. We got another couple of miles, which on a downhill mountain road takes much longer than a city or a town. Uncle Kermit fell asleep again, and I mean full head snap, chin to chest, snoring everything. We both saw it immediately, started wailing on the glass. Thankfully it worked and woke him up. It woke him up so fast that he didn't know where the hell he even was and waved out the window like there was oncoming traffic or something. I had to laugh. Some shit just never changed, no matter what the situation was. After two more times, we were almost at the foothills of the mountain. It was only a 10 mile haul, but when you're going back and forth at 15 miles an hour, it does take a while. There was one big last curve before the grade straightened out and started to dip into the flatlands that would take you back to town. There were a few small communities between us and the hospital, nothing that would be able to stitch me up, however. Along that last curve, Kermit fell asleep, and he didn't wake up when we banged on the glass. The truck started to swing wide, 
really gained momentum around the bend. It was obvious that we we're going to roll, and I mean any second now. The back tire already felt like it wanted to lift off the ground and get the whole thing going. I watched in total disbelief as my dad threw open the back sliding window of the truck, dove through the gap, and got control of the truck enough to straighten it out. His legs were kicking in the air above me, kind of like some crazy dream sequence. When Kermit woke up this time, he was furious for some reason. What the hell, Dale? What are you doing? He yelled. You fell asleep again, you old dipshit. You almost flipped the truck. Hit the brakes and let me drive before you kill us all. My dad yelled up at him. That seemed to bring him back to reality. He guided the truck to a stop just before the road straightened out. Dad got behind the wheel and Kermit slid into the passenger seat. I did my best to batten myself down for what I figured would be a crazy flight to the hospital. And it was. At least at first. A little nook of town popped up and a couple of houses and a gas station and a bar. When dad slowed down and started rolling his window down, I leaned over to see what was up. He gave me a quick hard look. How's your leg? He asked. I looked it over before answering. It's not bleeding, but it's hurting pretty good, I said. He nodded. You want to get a beer before we hit the hospital? Whoa. If I thought driving in chainsaws was cool, this whole new pinnacle of the word stop for a beer with my war wound, you better believe it. I said yes and dad guided the truck into a little nosedive called Crazy Woman's or something to that effect. To this day, it's one of the smallest bars that I've ever seen. Inside was dark, dingy, and the bartender was covered in cat hair. We sat at the bar and Kermit ordered us three beers, to which the keeper obliged. But he gave me a funny look when he set the bottle down in front of me. Right away he started asking questions, saying I didn't look old enough to drink. This was a setup of some kind. My dad cleared it up really quick. He nodded down to my leg, which I quickly brandished through my ripped jeans. As dad explained my grisly wound, the bartender lit up, totally blown away that we would take the time to get a beer. So blown away that he didn't charge us for the round, wished us luck, hoped it wouldn't have to get amputated. My dad, Kermit, and I said thanks and then hopped in the truck, blasted off to the next town. We ended up stopping at three more bars before we made it back to town into the hospital. It was simply too good of a bar trick not to cash in on. Absolutely no one would care once it got stitched up, but right there as an open wound, it was good for at least three beers. I wasn't even old enough to drink. My wound was all the identification that I needed, as this was a bit of a different time. Alas, when I finally got to the hospital, they stitched me up in no time. It turned out to be a pretty superficial wound. I went through a lot of fat. My dad did a bang up job of treating the wound with what he had. I didn't lose my leg, thankfully. I only damaged my liver a little bit. But I can say, I survived. I lived in Tucson during my years as a young criminal. I didn't bother graduating high school. I moved right to working the street, which is really only half truth. I was a party animal who only moonlighted as a criminal. I ran with small crews of guys that I've been friends with for life. They were all involved in different aspects of criminal activity. Everything from stealing, robbing, racketeering, even working as a border fencer or a coyote for those who don't know. Some of these guys could go down to the border and get paid five grand a head for every single person they brought over illegally. The work always varied, but always paid in stacks by the end. Well, after a few years in the street life, I find myself very close to actually living there. It turns out we weren't particularly talented criminals. We made enough to stay fed, stay high, and party, but only a couple of us had a place to stay. Rob had an apartment in a sketchy neighborhood on the south side, and Juan rented a little dumpy house not far from that. The rest of us either crashed with them or other friends, or with girls that we were dating at the time. At this point, half of us were on probation or evading warrants and charges, so mostly just laying low in the way of work. The things that we were doing was a lot of drug dealing. We ran a tight circuit throughout our neighborhood. We had enough of a roster to keep supplied and secured. No one sold anything without giving us a cut between one street and another. That's just how it was. At this point in my life, I thought I was at my lowest. 
Little did I know that in just a year or two after this incident, half my friends would be dead or in prison, and I'd be living on the street, dodging people who intended to murder me too. It didn't feel quick while it happened, but looking back, it was almost overnight. It's like the old metaphor about the frog in the pot of water. It'll never jump when brought to a slow boil. It was me in the pot though, and I couldn't tell the water around me was already at a simmer. Anyway, I was living between two apartments with two different girls that I was dating. They did not know about each other. This was a little personal scheme that I was running, as I had no interest in a long-term relationship with either of those women. This just made it to where I had a safe place to crash, cash in my pocket, and food to come home to. Dating these women was my version of a safe house. Judge me if you want, but it served its purpose and everyone was happy. One night, we were all holding counsel at Rob's apartment, as we normally did. It was up on the third or fourth floor, so it had a nice view of the neighborhood and let us feel like underworld royalty. Honestly, the place was a dump. Stained walls, holes in the drywall, dirty floors, burned carpets, the whole nine. It was a cross between a crack shack and a frat house. It was headquarters, the party place, and where we'd hang out on days we didn't want to do any of that. One night, we were counting money and talking business, but everything just kept coming up short. Our average rake for the week was usually double whatever it was we had on hand, so we knew something was up. That's when in passing, our friend Moose mentioned that he saw someone dealing in our stretch of turf. He didn't do anything about it, as Moose was one of the guys on probation, so we just followed the guy back to his house and got a visual on that place. It looked like a pretty average apartment, no outside decor except for a smoking chair. We all took great interest in this, and a select few of us hopped in Rob's car to go scan the place. A few others laced up to do a walk by. The rest of us just stayed at the house, ready to roll out at any sign of trouble. Moose stayed back, and as did I. He filled us in on what he'd already seen, as he staked the place out for a couple of hours the night that he found it. He said it was average traffic. A couple of people would come and go every hour. Pretty obvious some kind of sale was going on. Others would come and stay a little longer, then eventually leave. Then sometimes, randoms would leave the house, people he never saw enter, which told him there was at least some kind of assortment of crew inside, more than just dealers probably. A couple of hours later, we got our answer. The people on foot got back first, then Rob barreled in with the car, parked around back to keep it off the street, and hustled up to the apartment. Our buddies on foot had already filled us in a bit. They did a little stake out of the apartment. When they were sure sales were being made, a little group approached the door and knocked. They pretended to be looking for a pickup. The people in the apartment let them right in, at which point our crew hardened up. A couple even drew guns. They unlocked the door behind them and let in even more of our crew, who ransacked the place, and then everybody fled. They issued a warning before they left, though. This was a claimed area and no one would be stepping on us. Find somewhere else to conduct business. With that, everyone retreated back to Rob's. They did it carefully to avoid being followed back. What they came back with was in the ballpark of $25,000 worth of street value. I'm talking pounds on pounds of weed, ounces of cocaine, and piles of all kinds of pills. It was the exact kind of come up we were looking for. And it was between crews, so it's not like our probation officers were going to hear about it. Ripping off a dealer isn't like knocking off a 7-Eleven. Repercussions are between people and the laws they decide for themselves. Well, over the next eight months, our crew completely fell apart. A bunch of us got caught up in a raid over at Juan's house. The others got picked up on corners and back alleys making deals. Those who didn't get jammed up by the law ended up catching beatings or even worse, all at the hands of who we assumed was the other crew that we ripped off. Word was that the guy that we ripped off wasn't just a little street team like us, but an extension of a real gang somewhere in the valley. They were coming to test the waters in Tucson, as they had affiliation with cartel associates. This means these guys were not to be trifled with, but we had no way of knowing that. We were way too quick on the trigger, and after the night that Rob and the guys ripped them off, it sealed our fate. They made one call. The cartel honchos had our number. It was dicey everywhere. Very quickly, we realized that nowhere was safe. Even of the girls that I was shacking up with got wise that times were seedy. She gave me the boot. I couldn't really blame her, but damn, I was pissed at her. People are getting locked up or killed, and you shut the door? 
ruthless, but again, I get it. There weren't many of us left by the end of those eight months. Whittled down from 20 to just five or six. It was hard to tell though, because more of us were scattered to the wind every single day, getting out of town, or at least out of the neighborhoods before things got any worse. It felt like hunting season was on, and we were the only game out there. We couldn't sell drugs anymore. No one would do business with us of any kind. I mean, we could get little things here and there, but the big transactions, forget about it. There was no way for us to get ahead anymore. Definitely no work coming our way. It's like we were wanted, so putting us to work would be like painting a target right on your back. We just continued to lay low. Every now and again, we would get together at Rob's apartment, get drunk and just shoot the shit. We compared notes on stuff that we'd heard, what went on through the hood, and just general counsel. It was a true wonder that this place never got raided. We'd somehow kept it secret this whole time. There was a small victory in that, even if we lost everything else. And lost we had. The guys that were left were getting seriously desperate. Most of us had jobs, even throughout the criminal string, even if it was just working the register at a gas station. Now, that's all we had. And even then, none of us wanted to work too local for fear of getting recognized. We needed to more satisfy the habits that we had, let alone cover overhead. Some of the guys were talking about going back to dealing, maybe on a different side of town, but others were talking about even more drastic action. Break-ins, robberies, ATM holdups, jam up a stash house like when we started this downhill spiral. Anything to turn a real dime just to come up a little. That was against the rules though, and we knew it. The agreement was to lay low for just a little while longer and eventually start popping up individually. It'd be easier to get in somewhere alone, without a crew, without working alongside the prior team. Shedding the reputation would help us all in the long run. I'm not sure that ever even came to fruition. Exactly one week later, I was supposed to go over to Rob's house and just kick it for the evening. I was hanging around with the girl that I was still seeing. She and I had actually gotten more serious because the other girl had walked. We spent more time together, got more intimate, Soon, I was hanging out far more than I ever did before. It was nice having more than just a physical relationship, but to actually hang out and share meals, watch movies, all that good stuff. It was the perfect thing for laying low. I got to stay home every single day and enjoy myself doing it. Well, the girl and I ran the clock, and I was getting laid over to Rob's, but only by 15 minutes. I was walking over there, and as I was leaving the house, and during my trek over to Rob's, I could hear sirens here and there. I don't know why, but it just gave me this weird feeling. They were all heading in the direction of Rob's apartment. I continued walking that direction, certain that it was just a coincidence. But lo and behold, his whole complex is taped off in every direction. The block is swarming with cops, detectives, heavily armored tactical teams, even canines, frothing up and down the sidewalk. It was damn near like a mini war zone. I called Rob for my cell, but there was no answer. Now I had to see for myself what the hell was going on. I walked around to the back of the building, where there's a plain metal door that allowed access to the building itself. It was kind of blocked by some bushes on the outside. Some genius had also painted employees only and stencil across both sides. It made it look halfway official, and no one ever really used it. Hell, there was a time that building was being torn through by cops, and we got some of our friends out through that door. It was just a little known secret of longtime renters. I got in but didn't even make it to the stairwell before some cops busted me. They didn't draw guns or anything, but they were stern, very serious about how the hell I'd gotten inside. I told them about that door. I gave up the secret exit of the ages and explained that I was just here to visit my friend and he wasn't answering his phone. I said I was late. I had a bad feeling about whatever the hell was going on. They asked what unit he was in and I said the number. Both guys shook their heads and said, sorry, that's who we're here for. I was devastated, but not shocked. Like I said, the second I heard those sirens, I just had this bad feeling. And now, I had the confirmation. Both the cops said something weird then, said, Hey, since you know the guy, why don't you give us a statement so we'll have somewhere to start? It'll really help the investigation. Maybe get some justice for your friend. I said okay, and they brought me up to his apartment. I wasn't allowed to go inside, but they told me what they thought happened. Someone had entered the complex, came straight up to his unit. They knocked once, loud and hard. 
waited for Rob to open up the door. The moment that he did, they discharged a 12-gauge shotgun three times in rapid succession, which effectively cut my friend in half at the waist. Now, I was in shock. It was the worst thing that I ever heard in my entire life, and as you can tell, I wasn't very sheltered. I gave them the cleanest version of a report that I could, short of the robberies and drug dealings. I told them about a local crew who had that cartel affiliation. They moved drugs in bulk, they were armed, and they'd been involved in lots of violent activity in the city over the last year. I even told them where the original apartment was. The detectives wrote everything down, but the moment that I mentioned the cartel, they didn't seem super interested in a follow-up. I got the hell out of that town, and I mean that night, with clothes on my back. I told my girlfriend what had happened. She swung by to pick me up, and I told her to drop me off at the bus station. I was catching a ride out of Tucson. She asked me where, and I said I was going anywhere away from the border. I had to hide for at least a couple of weeks, but in reality, I disappeared for a couple of years. I found myself on the streets of Flagstaff for a short stint, before the weather got real and the cold sent me packing. Phoenix caught me next. I lived on the streets for almost 10 months. I even turned myself in for some minor crimes just to get on probation, have a routine, and have a check-in. In my mind, I was still being hunted, so being on a radar was good for me. It also gave me a peace of mind for anything catching me up down the road. I was on and off inside 18 months, and I found a room to rent inside that time. Rob had a lot on the hook. He was one of the few guys in the crew that actually had a roof over his head. So he had rent, a car payment, insurance, utilities. The guy had real bills. It wasn't just parties for him. So when everything dried up, he got hit the hardest and became the most desperate. He rolled a couple of those corner guys, rolled a stash house, and eventually, somebody followed him home. You can only assume that they were part of that original crew that we ripped off to begin with. Here is the scariest part, at least for me. And this isn't even me speculating, but exactly what those detectives told me the night that Rob was murdered. They said, had I been on time, I would have walked in literally minutes before the shooter arrived to the building. When they knocked, they would have shot us both point blank. Absolutely no doubt about it. They said I was incredibly fortunate to have been late that night. It literally saved my life. That's why I was so desperate to leave that night. I knew that my luck was not going to last. When you survive something like that, you don't keep living the same way. You take a serious inventory of what you have and what you want, and what you value, and then prioritize from there. Rest in peace, Rob, and everyone else not around from those days. During COVID, my entire life fell apart at the seams. Money quit coming in. We couldn't leave the house. My wife and I were already growing distant. Her son and I have never been close. Jan and I got married late in life when Luke was already born and pretty much grown. I knew him as an angry, borderline violent young man. He was a bully throughout his time in school, a vandal to the public. I don't think I ever saw him smile, hand to God. The kid was never happy or in a good mood at all. He was like the kid out of a cartoon with just a thundercloud over his head all the time. When I stopped working, we all got cooped up in the house and things spiraled out of control. We couldn't talk to each other, let alone look each other in the eye after just six or seven months. Everyone drank, everyone smoked, and the place quickly grew very unstable. I knew things wouldn't last, so I started quietly packing my things, planning my escape. I'm a plumber by trade, I have no trouble finding work, so when things opened back up, I quietly saved my pennies. By the end of the first COVID year, I had a decent little stash of money, and I had totally rehabilitated our old motorhome, which was one of those old trucks with the camper on the back, but fully outfitted it. It was going to be my chariot to freedom. Things had gotten crazier than a shithouse rat in our home, though. I fought with Jan every single day, screaming matches, shoving matches, all the crap that leads to jail time. I wasn't about it. I didn't want to fight with anybody. Luke was even crazier, spending every waking moment on the internet. He'd gone from a high school bully to a stereotypical conspiracy theorist. Everything was a government cover-up, a chemtrail, Chinese act of terror. He lived in a fantasy land, 
And because of that, had grown even more violent and unpredictable inside our household. More than once, our interactions turned physical. Once while we were having an exchange in the kitchen, I just simply turned my back to him and went back to my business. I was done with the conversation because it was going nowhere. I opened up the fridge to get something to eat. And this kid comes up behind me, my own stepson, and wraps me up with both arms, squeezes the air out of me, and pulls me back closer to the counter. He threw me to the side, slammed the fridge door closed, took out a knife out of the block. He then threatened me at knife point, saying that we don't eat under the same roof, and all this other batshit fringer elitist alpha shtick that he gets off the web. It was scary as hell being picked up like that. I'm obviously older, but also a good deal smaller than Luke. He could have killed me if he wanted to, with or without that knife. I just went limp after he hoisted me in the air, like I was already dead or something. But I could feel something more than that. I could feel how angry he was. I don't know how, but I could just feel his animosity and how badly he wanted to injure me in that moment. It was really bizarre, and I've never felt anything like it since. Another time I was bringing in groceries, Jan was berating me for not getting enough or not getting the right product, some other minor inconvenience. I snapped back and defended myself. Then here comes Luke, barreling down from the upstairs bedroom, immediately smashed his forehead into mine. This was just as I was turning around from the car trunk, arms loaded with groceries, so I couldn't really defend myself. He clocked me so hard that it rattled my teeth, totally shook my brains up. Then he pushed me hard enough that I fell back into the trunk. From there, I panicked, as I'm very claustrophobic. I knew Luke would be crazy enough to shut the hatch and lock me in there. I dropped the grocery bags and scrambled to my feet, just in time as I saw those gears turning. He realized then he could have done it. I told him that I was calling the police, at which point he and Jan cooled off and went back inside. I brought the groceries inside but made sure to avoid them both for the rest of the day. After that incident, I made leaving my top priority, above even getting divorced. I finally told Jan what was going on, that I wanted to leave as well as get separated, but she wasn't having it. She took right to berating me saying that she would never sign anything and would never do anything to spare me any difficulty. She wouldn't lift a finger if it meant making something easier for me. All right, so be it. Anything is better than here. I took my last of my belongings and drove the motor home right down the road. I didn't really have a plan for that night, but I had a plan for my future. I milled around the city for a couple of days, got my road legs under me and learned the ins and outs of trailer living. It wasn't so bad, I kind of liked being able to relocate at a moment's notice. After 10 days, I stocked up on some supplies and jumped the border into Mexico. I spent that first night on a beach, didn't even know the name of, drank beer that was pretty much free, and saw more stars than I've ever had in my entire life. Life went a little weird for the first couple of months, but freedom tasted so damn good. As I mentioned before, I'm a plumber, so there was still work everywhere. Lots of people needed little odd jobs done, and they would pay me in all sorts of helpful ways. I got to know people in my community, and even learned a little Spanish. Having lived in California for so long, a lot of it seemed to come naturally. I kept up with some friends back home, and everything I heard sounded par for the course. Janet would not grant me the divorce, and so I had gone back to her old ex-husband, Luke's real dad. The household was more of the same, screaming, holes in drywall cops in the driveway every single night. After a few months of being away, I felt more than happy with my decision, living my childhood dream on a full-time road trip, and the people I left behind were still suffering. Not that I really wished that, but the hell they put me through was enough for me to think that it was justified. I got a call just a few weeks ago, a month at the most, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I turned to the internet and looked up the story. Headlines were everywhere, pictures of people that I knew. I dodged a bullet, literally, but not at the cost of others. Luke had finally snapped. He drank enough, smoked enough, and spent enough time online reading those conspiracies. One day, something just sent him spiraling so hard that he went into his room, got a gun, and shot both of his parents right there in the house. Then he left the gun on their bleeding corpses went about his normal business the rest of the day. 
when authorities found their bodies and reached out to Luke. He told them it must have been a murder-suicide. His parents had been fighting for a long time. It was a real tragedy. The police didn't buy it for a second. The crime scene was painfully obvious. The staging was horrendous. These people had been shot by a third party. The gun had been lazily dropped without any inclination of ballistics. Luke got locked up and is currently facing double homicide charges. Jan and her husband are dead. So I got my divorce in the most horrific way possible. Had I stuck around any longer, it could have been my corpse discovered right next to Jan's, the bullet hole still leaking. This was a national headline for this year. You may find it, but their names won't be Luke and Jan. I still go back and forth to Mexico, but everything is different now. It's hard to feel good about a lot of what I remember. The whole thing breaks my heart, as what I survived is a tragedy, regardless of who it happened to. That kid was a ticking time bomb, and I just managed to get out of the way in time. I often struggle with sleep paralysis when I'm stressed out with school, or my anxiety is really terrible at the time. For context around the time of this dream, I was 13. I had just gotten out of an abusive relationship which put a lot of stress on me. I was terrified my ex would try to come after me, like he often threatened to do if I ever broke up with him. He was held back multiple times, and lied about his age to make it easier for him to groom me. He was 16 years old, which still makes me sick. I know it might not seem like that big of a deal, but me being 13 at the time, three years was a big age gap. He knew my home address and he had many firearms. The entire relationship was abusive and overall toxic. I was in constant fear of my safety. Luckily, that didn't last much longer. He stopped trying to reach out to me and stopped stalking me on social media. I guess the message finally got through to him that I was never coming back. It was roughly five weeks after I broke up with him that the sleep paralysis started to happen. At first it was just me being unable to move and it was relatively hard to breathe, which was still terrifying, but definitely not as horrifying as the sleep paralysis that I would have about a week later. I never liked being in my room alone, period. But recently, I got increasingly more uncomfortable being in there by myself. I started to hear little things, like tiny knocks or taps along my walls and windows, even inside my closet. My closet, of course, is the only room that has an access panel to the crawl space in the ceiling, which made me even more uncomfortable sleeping in there. I constantly had a feeling of being watched while inside my room, particularly in the closet. A couple of times I swore that I saw a man or a humanoid figure race across the opening of the closet door. I would always run and tell my parents what I saw, but they would always tell me the same thing. I think you've been watching way too many scary videos, or maybe you shouldn't be staying up so late, your mind is probably playing tricks on you. Which sure, I guess they could be right, but nothing changes the fact of the strange and horrifying dream that I had later. I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. I quickly realized I was in another sleep paralysis episode when I groggily attempted to look around my room. My body was completely stiff as a board, and I was unable to move anything beside my eyes. Usually, I'm a very hard sleeper. I never wake up in the middle of the night, but I knew something had to have woken me up in my sleep. I tried to look around the room a little more. I always had a fan pointing at me while I slept, but tonight, it was turned off. I swear I turned it on before I crawled into bed that night. I thought maybe I just forgot to do it since I was really tired. As I was contemplating if I really had plugged it in, I noticed that the door to my closet was slightly open. Now, I know I hadn't opened up that door before I went to bed, just because of how scared I was of it. My heart began to race. I could even hear it. My eyes darted around the room, trying to look for anything that might have been in there. When I started smelling something terrifyingly familiar, it was the cologne of my ex-boyfriend that he constantly wore. But something was off. It was almost as if the smell of the cologne was mixed with the smell of a dead animal. 
My heart was in my throat and I started to cry. I thought my worst fear had finally come true. My psychotic ex-boyfriend finally made it into my house. As I was hyperventilating and crying, I heard a small thud in the corner of my room. I held in my tears and gathered the courage to look in the direction of that sound. My eyes started to focus on the darkness of that corner. When I started to make out a tall, shadowy figure, hunched over. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I began hyperventilating even more, trying to at least move some part of my body to reach my phone. It looked as if the figure was turning back toward me, facing the corner. I tried to scream again, and a small audible gasp came out of me. The figure turned slowly to face me. It was hunched over and draped in a dark cloth. Its back was bony and stuck through the thin drape. Its hands were nothing but skin and bone. Its nails, or more like claws, were longer than the fingers themselves. I tried to focus even more as my eyes felt like they were being permanently opened wide. I made out more features of this terrifying creature and noticed that it didn't have a face. And that's what terrified me the most. It didn't have a face. I was practically sobbing as this creature made its way over to me. I noticed the horrible mixed smell of death and my ex-boyfriend getting stronger as it got closer. The smell almost became too much for me to bear as I felt like I might scream and vomit at the same time. The creature started to climb up onto my bed and straddle me. I sobbed even more. It reached out its bony hand and put it around my throat. This is something my ex-boyfriend always did to scare me, and once he even tried to strangle me in the school library with just his bare hands. The creature's hand tightened around my throat, and I could feel it as he was actually doing it. I could feel everything happening to me. Suddenly, it started to speak in some extremely low and monotone language that I couldn't quite understand. It almost sounded like an imitation of English, like how someone might sound if they only heard the English language a couple of times. The room got extremely cold, to the point that I could see my own breath. I felt as if I might pass out when suddenly, the creature stopped. It stood up off my bed and walked into my closet and shut the door like nothing ever happened. I was finally able to move again and immediately check my phone for the first time. It was 2.45 a.m. I leapt out of my bed, still hyperventilating and sobbing, and ran to tell my parents. I threw open the door and woke them up. They were furious with me, but when they saw that I was crying, they immediately became concerned. My dad asked me what happened, and I told him the story. He started to calm down, and do his old lines again saying that I was just imagining something. But he looked down at my neck and saw the large abrasions and marks from that creature's hand. He quickly became concerned again, grabbed his gun and ran into my room. He threw open the closet door, but obviously there was nothing there and the fan was turned on like I always had it. My dad turned to me, said I must have still imagined it, but he refused to talk about it afterwards. I knew he was a little creeped out and terrified, just like I was, and I knew he now believed me. A little bit after that dream happened, my dad went back into my room and started complaining about the smell. He smelled the same thing that I did. I didn't elaborate because I was afraid he would tell me the same thing that he always did. I'm imagining it. But the fact that he smelled it too confirmed that it wasn't just a dream. I've never been a believer in the paranormal but I believe this might have been an encounter with an actual demonic entity of some kind. Whatever it was, it used the distinct smell of my ex-boyfriend and one method of his abuse to scare me. I haven't had another sleep paralysis dream since, and I hope I never do. I'm sitting on my bed right now, writing this, and I still have that feeling like I'm being watched. This isn't my actual story, but a story that my grandmother told me about one of her aunts back many years ago. The story will be a little difficult for me to tell, as my grandmother came to America as a refugee and an immigrant. Even for me, 
there was a bit of a language and cultural barrier. I've always been intrigued by this tale and thought I would take the opportunity to share it with you all. My grandmother and much of my family comes from Laos. This is a small, narrow country in the southeast mainland of Asia. During the Vietnam War, there is a secondary conflict going on in my home country called the Secret War. The CIA wanted to break up all the support for the Vietnamese fighters, including supply lines, which they believed tracked it right across the border of Laos. The Secret War started with just simply boots on the ground. Select military units chosen to run top secret operations in each village or town. Grandma said that it was mostly policing. American soldiers were looking for weapon caches, supply depots, anything that might help the Vietnamese cause. As the conquest took place, my grandmother's aunt began talking with an American soldier who would frequent on the outskirts of the village. Their exchanges turned romantic, and soon the soldier was learning to speak the traditional Hmong. They shared gifts, held hands, and ultimately held a vision of a future. The aunt, who I'll call Anna, became smitten over time with this charming mystery army man. One week, he failed to return though, and Anna was devastated. Usually when a person vanishes from the area, regardless of nationality, it was usually due to the war. People were dying in the trees around the village every day, as they could hear the gunfire battles across more distant hills, or forces clash along the border. Still, my aunt held out hope that he was alive and would wait for the American every day along the outskirts of the village. Over time, the secret war ramped up into what was essentially non-stop bombings of the jungle and villages. Nowhere was safe for my grandma, and it wasn't uncommon to see women running at full sprint through the trees, clutching a baby to their chest, trying to escape the blast zones. The descriptions that she gave of these scenes were haunting. I could tell by just the way she spoke. Those caught in the crossfire would quickly learn something though. There was no escaping the blast zone. The tactics employed by the American military are what we now know as carpet bombings. Planes would roll by every hour, offload whole cargo supplies of missiles, which raised massive swaths of the country and wildland. The CIA was convinced there were tunnels as well as supply caches and sought to destroy them rather than just monitor them. When things got this bad, the villagers of Laos had very few options for survival. They didn't know anything about the tunnels, but there were caves, whole networks of them laid into the hills and mountains. This was the only place people could hide from certain death. The people got an idea of the bombing schedules and the amount of time between hearing the first engine and the first explosion on the ground. This allowed them to build a loose timetable of safety. They could leave the caves for perhaps a few hours at a time to forage and evacuate their belongings from the village. It was never long though, before everyone went scurrying back into the dark, rocky pockets of the earth. Regardless of the schedules, no one ever left the caves at night. Too many soldiers prowling in the jungle, and the bomber planes came too consistently in the dark too. War is made when no one can see it coming. One week came and brought the most terror yet. The ground didn't stop shaking for five days, or at least so my grandmother said. The firefights in the jungle were getting closer, heavier, less dead air between the reports. Sometimes it wouldn't stop for hours, and the only thing they could hear in between were the screams of the wounded and dying. They crawled into the cave that night and went far back, where the air was clean and heavy in the great stone chambers. They used lanterns and candles to light up some of the walkways, or places where they had to crawl. These places were mostly near the entrance of the cave, so as one would progress deeper, they found the chasm growing darker and darker. It also meant my grandma and our family could see the shadow of people approaching. My grandma said it was very late, everyone else was sleeping, when she heard something echo through the chasm and up into the chamber. Her eye shot open, and she watched the flickering light that illuminated the cave entrance, maybe 30 below her at a gentle slope. Nothing disturbed the glow, but the sound continued. It was footsteps, or something similar to it. There were 20 or 30 villagers sleeping in this particular area of the cave, piled together for warmth and security in the unexplored darkness. 
My grandma didn't bother to wake anyone up because she assumed whatever the shambling or scraping sound was would surely do it. But no one ever stirred. She waited alone, petrified in fear. Then she heard a voice muttering from somewhere unseen. Grandma couldn't make out the words at first, but soon it was close enough to place. It was a familiar, odd voice of an American. It was the soldier that Anna loved, mumbling in woefully broken Hmong. He was saying, I'm back for you, over and over again. The strange part was, each time he said it, he spoke it in a different tone of voice. The first time it sounded sad, and then happy, then excited, and scared, and so on. It sounded like an American, or whoever it was, was practicing their speech while navigating the chasm. Sometimes they would even be laughing in between the words, or chattering, whatever strange sound he'd be making in the dark. Grandma grew terrified as the voice approached, and did the only thing her young mind would ever allow, close her eyes, go still, and just wait. It was too late to wake everyone up now, or even so, what would they do in the face of an American soldier? There weren't weapons in the cave for protection, as most of those hiding were women and children. Something came shambling out of the tunnel up the rock face, something far larger than a man. Its massive silhouette blocked out any whisper of the light that emanated from the chasm and seemed to grow taller and wider with each step. My grandma watched it from behind her eyelashes, but once it was within a few feet, she could hear it breathing. She closed her eyes for real this time and prayed for anything but death. It touched her then. A big heavy hand came down and rested on her shoulder for a moment, as if the visitor was kneeling down to rest. She then felt that great hand slowly slide down her arm until it stopped atop her own hand. And when it did, she could feel the details for what they were. It wasn't a hand though, but a huge furry paw, like that of a cat. It had the soft pads between the tufts of hair and retract claws that came up to a razor tip. Before she could react, someone else stirred in the darkness. It was Aunt Anna, who quickly but silently had climbed to her feet. Grandma heard an exchange of words then, between Anna and the creature. Then they both moved toward the tunnel and the exit of the cave system. The thing that spoke with a soldier's voice led them, and Anna followed along just a few steps behind. My grandma watched in confused horror as her aunt disappeared through the cave hollows. Here's the reality though. No one ever saw Aunt Anna again. This was a big incident for my family living in Laos, as one of our own vanished in the middle of the night when everyone else was safe and accounted for in the caves. Sympathy and assistance in searching was non-existent due to the war, and Anna was swept away in the pile of assumed casualties just like all the others. My grandma, for whatever reason, seemed to enjoy telling this story. I think she struggled with carrying that guilt for a long time, especially since she was the last person to see Anna alive and may have been able to save her. So she made sure to tell that story regularly as a kind of an honor for her passing. I think it also served as a neat little nugget of culture for us grandkids who escaped the turmoil that our elders had to endure. I don't know what that creature was that came into that cave, but it seemed like it wanted to be human, or maybe even had been at one time. When I was in high school, I dated this girl my junior and senior year. After that crashed and burned, I was absolutely desperate to get out of my hometown and onto something new. My older sister at the time lived in Oklahoma City, thought she could get me a job, so I took the plunge. Within a week of graduating high school, I packed up everything that I owned, moved over a thousand miles away to a city that I'd never even been to. It wasn't a huge culture shock or anything like that, but there was some stuff to get used to. First off, the job that I had lined up for me started at five in the morning. But very quickly, I had to learn a whole new sleep schedule, which involved going to bed at a decent hour and waking up around four o'clock in the morning. The place that I worked was at a factory near the Air Force Base, so the entire commute was mostly on the edge of town. 
I'd weave through a few sparse neighborhoods, but a lot of it was just rolling fields of tall grass. Every single day, I would pass this creepy abandoned building that was more isolated than the other properties on this stretch of road. In the mornings, it would loom as a staunch black phantom out amongst the trees. It looked like a hole punched right through the fabric of reality, like something darker than dark, if that makes any sense. Honestly, I didn't give it much more thought, as this was just a commute drive for me, and by the time I'd pass it in the afternoon around 2pm on my way home, the sun would expose it as a ratty old brick and mortar building, like much of what you would see in Oklahoma. It was abandoned, somewhat vandalized, and a pretty good size. After a year of driving by it every day, I came up with the notion that it used to be a school, or maybe even some kind of office building. While living in Oklahoma City, I met a guy named Stefan who worked at a movie rental place near where I lived. Since I was new in town, I found myself watching a lot of rented movies on the weekends, and naturally, Stefan was my first friend living out here. He was a tall, handsome, and reclusive guy who daydreamed about working as a mortician and was even going through the motions to become a certified embalmer for a local mortuary. As you can imagine, Stefan had some peculiar interests. He was always pulling little practical jokes on me, like pretending he had a pocket full of loose cadaver teeth, that kind of thing. He loved horror movies, scary movies, rumors, anything that got the heart pumping. Now, Oklahoma isn't the oldest or most cultured place in America, but there is an odd amount of allegedly haunted stuff across the state. Stefan liked to investigate whatever he could find, mostly random stuff that we'd overhear about around town or from folks in the video store. Sometimes he'd just find stuff online. Whatever the case, at least once, maybe twice a month, he dragged me along on some kind of adventure, usually in the middle of the night, and usually to find a ghost or a monster of some kind. Well, there was one day that I got home from work, and Stefan was already there waiting for me. He had a foot kicked out of his window as he smoked a cigarette in the unforgiving Oklahoma humidity. When I came rolling into the driveway, he sprang to his feet and rushed right over, already gabbing at my window that wasn't even rolled down yet. Whatever was going on, it had Stefan excited. Dude, there's this place we gotta go look at, he says as I get out of my car. What is it? I asked. I don't know, but I always wanted to go look at it. It's just up the road, came his response. I went inside, changed my clothes, and we hit the road. This was pretty unusual, as we did most of our ghost hunting at night. A lot of these places were condemned or on private property, so it required a certain amount of sneakiness. I really didn't know what to expect with the hour being so early. The drive was all too familiar to me. Stefan and I sucked down a couple of clove cigarettes, the snap crackly ones all the hipsters used to smoke back in the day. It was the same drive that I made to work, albeit a little modified. I was stunned when we rolled up to the old brick building on that isolated property, the one I drove past every single day. Damn, really? I said. I know this place. I drive by it all the time. Me too, Stefan confessed, and I've always wanted to see what it is. Well, why are we doing this now, in the middle of the day? I asked. Stefan simply brought up a hand and pointed to a sign hanging near the driveway entrance. It was a real estate sign, and the main phrase very clearly read, for sale, in big red letters. It was all kind of genius, because the sign we could roll onto the property and actually look around under the guise of being investors. We didn't have to snoop around in the dark with flashlights and pocket knives, and maybe put ourselves in real danger. Little did we know, we'd be in danger either way. We parked and just played it cool, actually took the time to get into character. We'd done a lot of breaking and entering, but not a lot of lying to gain entrance. We were both pretty young and driving a Toyota Matrix, not dressed like we had millions of dollars in our bank accounts either. If anyone came up to us and wanted credentials, I knew we'd really have to sell them a story to stay on that property. As we came up with our little lie in the car, we looked around and much to our delight, we saw there weren't any other cars around. The place was completely empty, save for us and that for sale sign. We got out and walked around the front yard first. I also figured and assumed it wasn't out of the realm of possibility for the place to be under 24-hour camera surveillance. It was a complete dump, but it was a huge facility. It would make for a great hobo hotel. 
Either way, we walked onto the lawn, commented on the trees, and spotted zero cameras. It was finally time to take a look. For whatever reason, I felt really caught up in whatever mystery was at hand. Looking back, I think it was just because I was a transplant. I wasn't from there or anything, but still, a place that I had come to know on my own had really been in the back of a true blue local kid's mind like Stefan. We walked up to what I perceived to be the front of the building, which was just a massive broadside of brick. There were narrow windows at the very top, big wide ones at the ground floor, and then narrow windows again along the ground level, which peered down into the basement. Almost every single one of these was smashed out, allowing a brief glance into the twisted shadows waiting for us within. We walked up to the ground level windows and crouched low to peer inside. The only way I can describe the state of the basement interior was as if a tornado had somehow passed through it. It was beyond destroyed, beyond gutted. It was something out of a World War II movie. The concrete along the walls and floors was shattered, paint and dirt splattered everywhere, evidence of a fire in one corner, and all the manner of furniture smashed into splinters. Anything that was once drywall or insulation was now reduced to dust and mold. Amongst the wreckage, though, there was a single wooden chair sitting upright, facing toward us. Tied to the back support was a single white balloon, free-floating a foot or two in the air. It was full of helium, like a real party balloon, and it creeped us out to no end, but also kind of satisfied us a bit. The place was definitely going to be weird. It only took me a minute to realize this broad side of the building didn't have a door, so it couldn't really be the front. We walked around to face the east side and came upon a staircase that led to a great opening with hinges on both sides, but no doors. Someone or something had blown the double doors open wide so anything could come and go. An old dying tree stretched over the entrance arch and beneath its scraggly limbs, we made out the name of the facility. St. Vincent's Home for Boys. It was written in faded block letters with a black accent bar around it. We were both kind of caught off guard, but hey, the place had a for sale sign, so we would have to be at least somewhat official. When we ascended the stairs, we found that it led into a long hallway, but there was a staircase landing. Then there was a small desk pushed up against the far wall. The top was covered with two or three inches of multicolored wax, which also ran down the legs to pull upon the floor. There were wicks and scorch marks on the top, so it became apparent that someone had burned candles, if not dozens of candles, atop that table, until they melted down and coated that entire thing. On the wall behind the table were some words that were painted, but the only ones that I remember said, We all die. I think the rest may have been in Latin. This place was a complete creep show, top to bottom. We went down the hall and found all kinds of creepy stuff on the walls and eventually some old clothes and briefcases scattered throughout some of the rooms, which were all kind of identical. It was like an old-timey hotel or something. The clothes had discarded items that were all seriously dated, like it was the same stuff from whenever the place had just been abandoned. I found a desk with a drawer that was sealed, so I lifted it up and jimmied the thing open. Inside I found some medical records that were 70 years old, names, social security numbers, it was unbelievable to see so much delicate information, completely forgotten in a box somewhere. The top floor was almost a time capsule, short of all the scary threats and ominous messages painted upon the walls. We found the stairs, which were dark, steep, and made of the same crumbling concrete. About halfway down, we found the first piece of a doll, and you know the kind. Thick, bendy rubber. Comes apart if you pulled hard enough. The basement must have had thousands of them down there in various states of disassembly. Some were still intact with crazy faces colored upon them, hair cut into psycho little styles, and half of them were splattered with red paint. It was the weirdest thing, and Stefan and I were kind of there for it. This place had everything our weird hearts desired. As we were coming down the stairs though, we heard something strange down in the basement, like a metal door clanging closed. We looked around, but we didn't see anyone, nor did we find a metal door of any kind. There were a lot of metal desks with drawers, but they all seemed too bent and warped to be able to close quickly like that. We even found a safe in one room that had yet to be opened. 
were actually shocked that no one pried it out of the floor and taken it yet. It wasn't really that big, but maybe the size of an end table. You could get it out of there with a couple of crowbars and a dolly. There was more creepy stuff painted on the walls, some of which I followed around to the back. The fawn lingered up in the front, where we saw that chair and the balloon, as he was fascinated with why it was down there. More candles had been burnt in a circle around that seat. I eventually stepped into a big bathroom, complete with a couple of tile showers and multiple toilets. It was like a small gym bathroom from the 1950s, with little checkered tile and drain built right into the floor. By the sinks, I saw some old rusted out medicine cabinets, most of which had been shattered to fragments. I walked up to them and moved one of them back and forth. It seemed to still have some good rotation on it. Something occurred to me then, and I slammed the metal frame of the cabinet and perfectly recreated that slamming that we heard earlier. Mystery solved. I went back and found Stefan, who was wide-eyed and ready to bolt back upstairs. I explained to him what I found, led him to the bathroom, and showed him everything. From there, we only discovered more rooms, more creepy odds and ends in the dark. There was all kinds of evidence of weird seances, rituals, whatever the hell they were all up to. Stefan had told me about different cults and devil worshippers that he'd looked up online, that allegedly had been in the area at the time. We started exploring some of the bedroom units on the back side, and that's when we heard the scariest thing. A man coughing, and not even really coughing, but like trying to clear his throat or something. We stopped and listened again. It sounded like it was coming from out of the walls around us. It would cough, clear its throat, but then turn to gasping and other guttural sounds just like it. It would get louder and louder until we were forced to book it back the way we came, and out into the sunlight. The basement was beyond black, like we'd step into another world down there. I swear the last thing I heard before climbing back to the first floor was that choking and gasping sound, and then it turned into laughter for just a split second. Stefan didn't hear it, but he was also ahead of me trying to get out of the basement with a quickness. He sought the stuff out, but was a bit of a turncoat the moment anything got too dicey. As we climbed the stairs, there was a tremendous banging coming from the concrete behind us. It sounded like the medicine cabinet clatter, but multiplied by a thousand. It felt like that whole building was shaking, all through a deafening metallic sound. To this day, we both have no idea what that could have been. Topside, nothing had really changed. No cops, no real estate agents, no property owner. We were still free to look around and explore. After poking around the last few rooms and snapping a couple of pictures, we hopped back in Stefan's car and went back to my place to debrief and talk about what the hell had just happened. The first thing that I wanted to do was some research. St. Vincent's Home for Boys was all that was running through my mind, and let me tell you, it's going to simmer in yours for a while too. We figured we'd find some history of failed business, but much to our surprise, St. Vincent's was originally opened in the 1940s as a mental asylum. Its operators were a group of Catholic rehabilitators known as the Brothers of Mercy, but very little of that was found there. Allegations of physical, mental, and sexual abuse came from patients between the ages of 9 and 90 years old against multiple male nurse staff of that asylum. Soon, allegations of murder began to surface. One nurse actually confessed to suffocating two different patients, simply to see what it was like. While this was all happening, St. Vincent's was constantly expanding, adding more rooms to house more patients. Throughout all of this, the Brothers of Mercy only helped and hired male staff and patients. The facility, after that nurse's confession to murder, eventually transitioned into the hands of Richard Dolan, who was a priest and rehab consultant as well. He wanted to remodel it into an all-male drug and alcohol clinic, where patients could live on site and receive both prayer and treatment from Dolan, work various jobs around the property in exchange for room and board. The all-male aspect was interesting because Dolan didn't keep it out of respect for the previous administrators. Father Dolan had been arrested for soliciting sex from a male undercover officer in the downtown district. It was also rumored to hire men from the flea market on 10th and Penn do odd favors for him on his day off. Dolan would operate St. Vincent's for only a few years, to which he changed the name to the main artery. His plans were to further develop the property, but that never came to fruition, 
as Dolan was found beaten to death in his apartment in 1988. His murder remains unsolved to this day. Friends of his claim that the priest had been attacked by a various stranger in the days leading up to the murder. Stefan and I gleamed all of this from an hour of scrolling on Google back at my place. We were both absolutely floored. The craziest part was that there was a semi-famous local ghost hunting team who had visited the facility within the last couple of years, had a lengthy breakdown of it on their website. We got to watch them in the videos, exploring the exact same halls. They even had some kind of EVP recording, a musty deep male voice saying things like leave or help. It was some of the most unsettling stuff that I've ever heard, and honestly brought me to tears when I heard it and read about it. I couldn't believe I had just been traipsing through a place where people had literally been murdered for fun. All those crazy sounds we heard suddenly made sense in a sickening way. Finding the truth online that night was mind-blowing, and not in a good way. Hell, even my commute to work was a dread every day after that. Not just seeing, but knowing what went on in there. I had no idea I'd been driving by one of the most haunted buildings in the entire state of Oklahoma. St. Vincent's Home for Boys is still standing to this day and remains for sale for any of you who might be interested. I lived in a haunted house as a kid throughout the 1990s, but nothing at all malevolent really happened, thankfully. The activity was overall what I would describe as scare tactics, but there was one potentially violent instance that shook me really well. The house itself was built in 1949, and it arguably had some creepy vibes to it and the surrounding property, but the focus of the story is the attic. The house was a square colonial style building on about an acre of property. The street side and right side were all lined with tall evergreen trees so that it was obscured from the road. There were two gravel driveways on the right side of those trees that led to two houses behind ours that were much newer, and at some point the old property had been sold and subdivided. And the left side had a thin strip of wood and an old stone wall that separated us from that neighbor. The woods then expanded into a large state forest that encompassed basically every house on the road. There was also a large detached two-bay garage that was on the left side, along with our driveway. These bays ran deep and could easily fit four cars, and there was a finished back room to the garage that was very creepy. Specifically, there was this large black burlap material covering the entire inside of the door that led to the backyard, but it had what could be described as what looked like a chalk outline of a very tall person woven into the burlap. That part always bugged me out as a kid, especially when I went in there for my outside toys and whatnot but nothing ever happened in the garage. The attic itself was a walk-up attic with a full set of stairs in the middle, split into the left and the right fully finished sections. If I had to guess, it had been completed in the 1970s, as they had used this puke green cut pile carpeting and installed fake wood panels that cordoned off the finished sections from the storage sections of the attic. In front of you, at the top landing, as well as directly above the door at the base of the stairs, are removable panels on the walls that led to the slope portions of the attic roof line, which were used as storage crawl spaces. The left of the stairs had this waist high retaining wall shelf, while the right side of the stairs had a full wall, which had this modest closet accessible from the right side of the attic, which also had a small removable access panel for something in it. My dad used the left half of the attic for his collectibles and stuff, while I had free reign of the right half as my hangout spot once I hit middle school in the late 1990s. I spent a lot of time up there playing video games, building Legos, and reading books. I had two chairs, a couch, a table. I could pick up basic TV signals and had whatever video game system of mine that I wanted at the time hooked up. It was almost like I had my own apartment up there. Now that the context of the attic layout is taken care of, the important bits to these occurrences are three removable wall panels. These things weren't just loosely put in place. They did take deliberate effort to remove, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Often while I was hanging out up there, at least the panel of the landing up top would pop out of its place in the wall, with enough energy to leisurely slide down the stairs and crash into the door at the bottom. 
The panels are like three footish tall and would have at least that link between the last step and the wall. If it was the one above the door, well, that one required even less to make a ruckus because there was only like an eight to 10 inch ledge that you had to use to access it. So that panel fell straight down to the 10 foot bottom of the stairs. I remember that ledge being the width of a VHS tape. This was a common version of the events. Nothing too crazy, but a little annoying having to put the panels back on the wall periodically. One time in particular though, I was sitting in the chair closest to the wall, blocking off my view of the stairs on the side of the attic. I was playing PS1 for a long gaming session. I'd paused the game and got up to, I assume, use the bathroom on the second floor. I make my way towards the stairs, but only a few steps. And then all of a sudden, both of the panels at either side of the stairway simultaneously fly off the wall with extreme force and collide in midair, then crash to the bottom of the stairs. I ran scared shitless downstairs and didn't go back up for at least a few hours. And when I say extreme force, I mean explosive force, like every panel flew at least 15 feet and would have definitely hurt someone if they were in that path. It was almost like the Hulk himself punched each panel off of the wall that they were seated into. And no, it wasn't a draft thing or a stormy weather thing. It happened pretty much in conditions that the house didn't have any kind of problems. I recall one of the less explosive events where I picked up the panel from the bottom of the stairs. I put it snug back into the wall, then turned around and took a few steps back to my area, and it did the same thing. I straight up said aloud, all right, I'm leaving. I packed it up and did something else somewhere in the house. I had at least two of my friends experience this phenomena on a few occasions, as well as my younger brother of three years. In fact, one of those instances, my friend C and I had locked my brother up there during one of the more eventful panel situations. We were kind of assholes back then. He was screaming to be let out of the attic. And he was so scared. Now that I think about it, that hook and loop lock on the outside of the attic door had been there ever since we moved in and it was the only door in the house to have one. Additionally, when I was much younger, I recall hearing those panels crashing into the door at odd hours of the night, but it was far, far less frequent then, until I started spending a significant amount of time up there. Most of these events would have taken place during middle school in the late 90s, when I was allowed to take over that spot. We moved when I was entering into high school in 2000. I recently drove up by the place this summer, it looked like it was being completely gutted or prepped for demolition. I have half a mind to pull up there and try to contact the new owners to see if maybe they experienced anything similar while they were there. If that place is even still intact next time when I'm in the area. When I was a kid, I had various encounters that led me to the conclusion that there might be an afterlife. I don't mean when I was like a little kid, but throughout my youth and teenage years, some small interactions told me that they were ghosts or an afterlife of some kind. After I got into high school though, nothing happened to me for a long time, and like clockwork, I kind of forgot that I ever believed in that stuff at all. Flash forward to my first time away from home, and I encountered something that sent me into flashbacks and made me remember all the crazy stuff from when I was a kid. What follows comes from my second semester in college. I went to school in upstate New York, like way upstate, where you discover a new level of cold. A few roommates and I lived in this creepy rundown apartment that we all swore was haunted. The place was dingy, dark, even if it was daylight outside, even with the windows open, nothing could bring light in. It made no sense. Now I guess we know the truth. Before we go any further, I want to say for the record that I definitely asked for it. The city where I lived is known for horrible weather, which kept me inside most of the time. And of course, ghost stories, among other things. Since I'd always been interested in the myths and the legends, I spent a lot of that time on the weird part of YouTube, eventually landing on some pages about ghosts, spirits, and how to invite them to communicate with you. To be clear, I never used a Ouija board or anything like that because hell no. But a few days prior to this event, I've been reading and watching stuff on calling out to spirits by saying things like, if anyone's there, make yourself known, or cool things like, if someone's here, I invite you to share my company. 
I'd also recently been introduced to the concept of a succubus, which is important for this story. As another important note, the layout of my bedroom was pretty wonky, but all that really matters is that my closet was really big and went all the way into the exposed attic, which made my room pretty cold most of the time. I couldn't see into the attic part because it was at a weird angle, but I always got this really creepy vibe being inside my closet, so I never even tried. Most importantly of all, my closet didn't have a door, so if I sat up in bed, all I would see across my room was this black, formless void through the closet doorway. I always thought that was super creepy, but I was still pretty fascinated with weird things at this point in my life, and my room was partially illuminated by a nearby streetlight outside. So at times, I didn't mind gazing into the empty, black abyss of my open closet door every night. Fun, right? Aside from all that, Buffalo isn't that nice of a place. There had been break-ins around the neighborhood, so I brought this big hammer that I kept on a hook behind my door. If anything ever went down, I could easily grab it with a quick lunge, and it made me feel halfway safe. Keep in mind that all this happened after many nights of me quote-unquote inviting things to my bedside to no avail. This incident happened on Halloween night, ironically, and I spent a large part of that evening drinking my face off with friends at a party. I blacked out at some point, so I wasn't even sure what time it was when I got home. My drunk ass randomly wakes up in my bed, facing the wall. I'm just getting my bearings, when I suddenly feel the girl that I brought home, big spooning me, cuddling me close with one of her arms wrapped around me. I hear her yawn and let out this quiet giggle before she starts playfully twirling my hair and sensually drawing lines down my ribcage around my back with her fingernails. Stepping out of my drunken stupor, I realized I couldn't remember who I brought home from the party. To me, this was kind of hilarious. I was desperately trying not to laugh. I was popular with some sorority girls at the time. I thought it'd be funny surprise to find out who'd come home with me. But then it clicked. I didn't bring anyone home. I would stumbled home alone, but I could still feel the hands on my back, someone's legs wrapping around mine, warm breath on my neck, and at that point, I freaked the fuck out. Suddenly the legs gripped tightly around mine, the way a python snares around its prey. Fingernails clawed into my back and wrenched my hair out of my scalp. Whoever or whatever was in my bed was going ballistic, attacking me like some kind of wild animal. I was so terrified that I was completely paralyzed, too afraid to turn around. I didn't know what to do, so I just started praying, praying that God would help me. After a few moments, the pain was so great that I finally sprung up. I scrambled out of bed, grabbed that hammer and flicked on the light. There was no one there. I just stood there in pure awe, holding the hammer and freaking the hell out. I went to the bathroom, got some water and then went back to bed with the lights on. Somehow, I eventually fell back asleep. In the morning, I got up and took a piss. I figured it was all a bad dream, until I got back into my room and saw the hammer sitting on my bedside table. From then on, I never tried to invite anything into my home. The problem is, some doors don't close that easily once you open them up. And as I said, that creepy closet didn't have one. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I got into an apartment that was just a little out of our budget. It was a spacious three bedroom setup. We originally signed the lease with the plan in place of having our friends move in as well, a bit of a roommate situation. She was going to rent a room from us and help alleviate some of the bills on our end. But this part never came to fruition. She ended up getting involved with some guy, no big deal, and she moved in with him. So by the time we moved in, was already digging a financial hole that we couldn't quite fill. It wasn't crazy overwhelming debt or anything, but there was just a subtle addition to what we owed every month. My girlfriend Deanna worked as a bartender, but also did real estate school on the weekend. She wanted to break into the property business and hopefully secure our first home in the process. I worked, and still do in IT and cybersecurity. Back then, I was just a grunt for a small company. I made peanuts for what I was doing. 
the new payment of the apartment was swallowing my checks whole and still demanding more. So I had to start side hustling and I started with freelance IT work. It was getting some bites, but what I encountered more often than not were people that just had outdated hardware. Laptops from 2009, desktops from 2001, truly ancient technology that no amount of updating or formatting would fix. So along the IT work, I started making tech sales. I was able to find all manner of cheap computers on websites like eBay and Craigslist, and then I'd further dix and upgrade them on my own. What originally was just a $50 Asus, I would turn into a decent $350 machine. My clients would buy them up. They already trusted my work, so being able to buy a trustworthy machine for me without having to go to the store was ideal for them. It kept everything simple for the folks who wanted to keep it simple. Well, after a year or so of hustling, the side gig turned into my main gig. I still work for IT for that company but I was making way more money on the side with my repairs and sales. Bills were no longer an issue. I was keeping up with all the work that I had going on. Long story short, I had over inventory in the way of desktop gaming systems. Someone had built them a gaming rig and then gave me a down payment and everything, then totally backed out when it came to delivery day. They owed me a flat grand for the computer, but knew they weren't gonna be good for it. Wasn't even interested in making payments, so let me keep their down payment, and told me to just sell the thing. I personally didn't know very many gamers, so I just threw it up on Facebook Marketplace for $900. I wanted to move it quick, get my money out of it, and not have to store it. The whole thing was bulky and took up a lot of space inside my office, so to get it gone and get it paid for would be a win-win for me. I was getting bites left and right, but mostly just people who were shopping for the specs. They wanted to know if it was water-cooled, all that good stuff. They were daydreamers and made it clear, wished me luck in my selling. I also had a healthy round of kids shooting low-ball offers or asking about payments, which I wasn't willing to do with a total stranger. The system itself was valued at $1,250, so $900 was more than a fair price. Hand me nine crisp bills and you get the gaming system of your dreams. After a few weeks of fielding offers and answering questions, I got a message from a guy who seemed both interested and finally serious. He was familiar with the processors, the graphics card. He knew its value. The weird thing was, he messaged me at 3 a.m. This should have been a red flag, but I just gave the dude the benefit of the doubt. As an IT guy, I'm a bit of a night owl myself, and I just assumed this dude worked swing shift or lived that gamer lifestyle slept his mornings away. Whatever the case, I answered him, and he seemed to agree on making the sale. And then, out of nowhere, he just went dark, completely disappeared, and didn't just stop messaging me, but his entire profile vanished from my history. I couldn't find him at all. When I clicked on our old conversation, it just said this user is unavailable. I figured he got cold feet, or maybe his account got deleted for some kind of inappropriate content or something. It was whatever, so I just kept my post up and waited for another buyer to come along. Fast forward a week. I got a couple of potential sales, but nothing too serious. It's the middle of the night on a weekday. My girlfriend and I are in bed. My phone starts blowing up like crazy, and that's really unusual. I rarely even get a text overnight, let alone a call. I look at the screen and who is it? It's the guy from a week ago who wanted to buy that computer. Who is it? My girlfriend asked blinking away the light. It's Tyler, I said, the guy that wanted to buy that computer. Are you going to answer it? She asked. I shrugged and threw the covers off. I felt like a crazy person actually answering, but it could be the quickest $900 I ever made. I went into the hall and hit the green answer button. Hello? I said. Hey, hey man, what the hell? This frantic voice comes through. Is this Tyler? I asked. Gamer Tyler? The line goes quiet for a second. Yeah, yeah, it's it's Tyler, man. The hell have you been? I've been waiting on that machine. I thought you were going to drop it off. I scratched my head standing alone out there in the dark. We had never agreed to any kind of drop off, so I figured there's some kind of miscommunication going on. Hey, I'm not sure if we had crisscrossed wires earlier, but I don't remember any kind of deal. If you're still interested in the computer, you're more than welcome to it, 
I said. I could hear him getting agitated through the phone now. Heavy breathing, snorting, rubbing his face and sighing. He sounded bewildered, totally frustrated. I talked him down a bit and told him the computer hadn't sold yet. I'd love to make the deal with him. But this is a work night. And now isn't a good time. Listen, dude, let's meet up tomorrow and make the exchange. I would love to offload this thing as soon as possible. It would make my life a lot easier. Let's message each other the details and then meet tomorrow after I get off work. All right, have a good night, was all he said before hanging up on me. It was cool to have a deal on the table again, but this whole exchange was just weird as hell and for some reason had me on edge. I got back into bed where my girlfriend was waiting for me. Well, she asked. I'm not sure, I confessed. He definitely wants the computer. He thought we already made a deal. I guess we had some kind of miscommunication, though. We're going to talk tomorrow and figure it all out. How'd he sound? I don't know, I replied. Nervous? Well, be careful. Make sure you feel him out before you meet him tomorrow, she explained. She's always been the voice of reason. When I woke up, I immediately messaged Tyler, and of course, no response. It didn't even register as it delivered. I sent him a few more messages from work, and of course, got no reply. And by the time the afternoon had rolled around, I had pretty much given up again. This guy was really flaky. I couldn't bank on this going through. I kept that post up and just hoped for the best. But then it happened. He called my phone and started blowing me up on my drive home. I answered and put it to my ear. Hello? I asked. Hey man, where are you? Tyler breathed into the phone. I'm ready. Dude, I messaged you like 10 times today. Where have you been? I asked, pretty irritated. This guy was starting to get underneath my skin. He came off entitled as hell and was probably some dumb rich kid. He didn't understand what it meant to waste someone's time. He got a little flustered and started throwing out excuses. He was busy, he needed to get the money together, he lost his phone, on and on and on. A lot had happened to Tyler in the last 16 hours apparently. Well, what do you want to do? I'm not even home yet and it's going to take me a minute to load up that whole computer, I said. Alright, shit, okay. How quickly can you get over here? He asked. Dude, I don't even know where you live. It's like you think we've been talking all day. What the hell is wrong with this guy? Well, I would find out soon enough. All right, can you meet me now? He ventured. No, was my reply. All right, well, when can you? He pried. Let me get home, let me load up the computer, have dinner, and we'll see if you're still interested, I explained. You've been so hot and cold this whole time, dude. I'll call you in two hours. If you still want the computer, just answer the phone. Got it? Okay, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I got it, he said. Have a good day. And with that, I hung up on him. I got home and told my girlfriend what was going on, and she seemed very disinterested, but also told me to be extra careful. Weirdos try to nab stuff off the web all the time. She offered to go with me, but I declined, as I knew she had a yoga thing that night, a studio down the street. We ate dinner and hung around the house for a bit. Then I decided it was time to see about the computer. I had it loaded up right when I got home. Now I just needed to finally sell this thing. Be careful, okay? I'm serious. This guy has been nothing but weird, my girlfriend told me. Yeah, yeah, I will, I said on my way out the door. And then it was on. I called the dude as I was backing out of my parking space. It didn't even have a chance to ring and he answered immediately, again with the same string of questions. Where am I? Am I close? Can I drop it off soon? All right, man, here's the deal. Where do you even live? I asked. And he gave me this rough idea. Okay, well, let's meet in the Taco Bell parking lot. There's one right up the road from you. You can expect the computer. We can do the old switcheroo, and then we'll both be on our way. I explained. Nah, nah, man, I don't like that. How am I going to know if the computer even works? He asked. This is just how it is. If you tried to work with me earlier, we could have sorted that all out. Do you want the rig or not? I asked. He huffed a bunch and then gave in, said he would meet me there. Perfect, it's not that far of a drive, and I kept the meeting in a public setting. I shot over, parked, and sent him a message that I was there. He said that he was getting close and that I should get out of my car so he would know who to approach. 
Just lean against my back bumper. Okay, weird, I thought. Not the craziest request in the world, but whatever. I got out and went to the back of the car and waited for my customer to arrive. A few cars skirted through the parking lot, but for the most part, there wasn't any foot traffic. A couple of people walking on the main drag, a couple of people walking between the store and their car. No one looked like the dude that I was looking for, and soon the light poles were buzzing to life. It got dark throughout the parking lot. I messaged Tyler a few times, and of course, no response. Even the Taco Bell slowed down, and I found myself somewhat alone. Hey man, a voice said from behind me. I turned and found someone lurking in the trees growing between the parking lots. They stepped out, and here he was, Tyler, looking disheveled and genuinely weird. His eyes were bugging out of his head. His skin was mottled and white. Uh, what's going on? You good? I asked. Yeah, just tired. I work a lot, came his response. I popped the trunk and showed him the computer. Got a lot more normal after that, just focused on the hardware. He looked at every little cord and receiver over and over, meticulous with each piece. Being that I worked in tech, this wasn't that weird to me. Half the time you can tell if this is something that's working by just looking at it. Like I pegged over the phone. I just figured this guy knew his stuff. The rest of the stuff was in the back seat, like the mouse, the cords, and keyboard. He looked that over too and then turned to me. So what'd you want, 600? He said. Nice try, I said with a smile. 900 takes it. This asshole reaches into his pocket, pulled out a gun, a dingy little automatic pawn shop special. I shook my head and cursed myself. I knew this guy was weird, and I knew I should have been more careful. My girlfriend's advice was just ringing my head as I looked down that barrel. I took literally zero precautions because I wanted to make a quick sale, and now I was about to take an L to a serious moron. Oh well, such is life. I didn't have a gun, and Tyler had me dead to rights. All right, this is how we do this, he said. Go ahead and unload everything here in the parking lot. Are you serious? I asked. All he did was raise the gun and put it in my face. I nodded and got right to work. I set everything in the parking space adjacent to my car, including the tower, the monitor, and everything from the trunk. Then he had me move it to the trees where he'd been hiding in originally. It dawned on me that he didn't have a car or he didn't want me to see what he was driving. It was kind of smart. I had to give him a little credit. After I finished moving everything, he put that gun in my face again. All right, go get in your car, count to 50, and then get out of here. Call the cops, do whatever you want to do, he said. Go on. Thanks, I remember saying for some reason. It still bothers me to the day that I thanked him for robbing me. I did as he instructed, then peeled out of the parking lot. Went down the lane and called the cops, who came out right away and took a report from me. Tyler was long gone, as was the computer. The guy was never seen again. I obviously never got my money and I never got the hardware back. I didn't get any more midnight calls from that clown, so I guess lesson learned. I was very cautious with all of my sales and business online after that, especially with bigger value sales, with people I didn't know. I'm sure a lot of people will think I'm pretty stupid for doing business the way I did, and well, you wouldn't be wrong. A couple of summers ago, I was having some serious car problems. At the time, I was going through all kinds of other crap. My boyfriend and I had just broken up. My savings were depleted. I was caught up in some drama at the place that I was working. In the middle of all this hectic time, my car starts acting funny, shaking whenever it started, blowing clouds out of the exhaust, the dashboard throwing codes and check engine lights. Pretty much everything that could go wrong seemed to be happening to my car all at once. Here's the deal, I know absolutely nothing about cars, and you can say it's because I'm a girl, but even if I were a guy, I still probably wouldn't know anything. I don't really care about cars, I don't care about understanding them, I'm more than happy to pay someone to do all that work. Back then though, especially being newly on my own, I had very little in the way of disposable income, so when the car started chugging and rattling, 
It had me sweating right away. If it was anything major, I would be out of a car because there's no way I could afford it. One of my friends made a suggestion to me, and that was to find a local mechanic online to just run simple diagnostics, locate the problem, and maybe work out a more feasible solution, depending on what it would cost me. My friend had just recently needed to get some work done, went through a guy advertising on Facebook, and not only did he fix everything wrong with their car, but he was totally transparent about the cost. The guy had since booked up and wouldn't be able to help me out for at least three weeks or maybe even more. My car was getting worse and worse every time I started it. I got to work finding someone else online and I started with Craigslist, but quickly found out I didn't like how just anonymous it was. I threw up a post and got dozens of responses within a day, but none of them had anything to do with fixing my car. It mostly was just a lot of unsolicited pictures and offers for dates and other kind of weird stuff. I scrapped that post within 24 hours and from there ventured out into the world of Facebook Marketplace. This seemed to be way safer off of the jump. People could see my post, see what I was looking for, and the people that responded also had a name and a face. Half the people that I commented on I recognized from somewhere around town. They said they'd keep an eye out for an affordable mechanic for me. By that Friday, I got a message from a guy named Simon, and this guy seemed pretty legit. His profile was a few years old, wasn't covered in over-sexually post or political propaganda. He seemed normal, and his account had a long history of doing mechanic work. Lots of photos of him working on cars and garages, wearing jumpsuits in the shop, that kind of thing. Simon seemed legit from top to bottom, and with the situation that I was in, it was all I was really looking for. Through DMs, I learned that Simon was branching out into his own self-employment and was doing all his own work. He had worked for a major dealership in town and then worked for a couple of shops after that, was fully insured and certified. This was music to my ears, all the exact stuff that I wanted to hear. Simon said he had one job where he was finishing up and that I would be next in line. We exchanged phone numbers and I started saving all the cash that I could. I was anxious, but things were finally looking up. I didn't really know what to expect cost-wise though, but I knew this was the best option and the one that I could most likely afford. I let my worry take the back seat and then tried to focus on things that I actually had control over, like my mood and how I performed at work. I scraped together a little extra cash, had a couple of good nights out and just relaxed. Things were good and if I let them, maybe they become great. Sure enough, I get a call a full day earlier than I was expecting. Simon was ready for me. He'd finish up with his last customer. The fix was easier than he first diagnosed, and the car was back on the road. Again, more music to my ears. I was starting to write all my problems off at this point, like a true sucker, until you get something in writing, or even better, and see the work with your own eyes. Never take anyone at their own word. That's how all of these marketplace websites work and it makes for a very deep headache. We exchanged information and I gave him every little detail that I could about my car. The normal stuff like the year, the make, the model, and symptoms of the issues that I was having, that kind of thing. He gave me the address to his garage and the time that I should arrived. Everything felt professional for a guy that I just found online, so I was even more enthralled with getting it all done and finally over with. I told Simon thank you so much for your time and that I would see him tomorrow. The address that he gave me was about a half hour away, on the side of town that I wasn't super familiar with. He told me to be there by 10 a.m. and I didn't want to be late, so I planned on leaving at 9. That never happened though. I woke to my phone buzzing around 5 in the morning with Simon. He said that his day had been thrown off schedule because he had an appointment later on in that day that he forgot about. He didn't want to leave me hanging. He asked if there would be any way possible that I could bring the car to him now, so he could at least take a look. I didn't work today, I was already awake, and plus, I just needed this to happen already. I told him I would be there as soon as possible. He sounds super excited, said goodbye, and I started getting ready. I blasted through a shower, pulled some clothes on, and scarfed down this microwavable breakfast, and then I hit the road. I don't even think the sun was up yet. I coasted along until I didn't know the roads anymore, and it wasn't until I went past that last stoplight that I realized I wasn't even in a neighborhood anymore. There were still houses out here, but there were big empty lots, full of grass between them. Still, 
Even with the dwindling civilization around me, I didn't think twice about it. At some point, I reached over to grab my phone, check my messages, and change the song playing throughout my speakers. The second that I picked it up, though, I get this incoming call from Simon, so I answered it right away. I put the phone to my ear as I prepared to say hello. I could hear Simon talking to someone else, though. He sounded weird. It was his voice, but he was talking in a totally different manner. Not professional, or street, if anything, if you get what I mean. Nah, she'll, she'll be here soon, he explained to someone, who sounded just as weird. Shh, shh, I'm calling her. Then they both got quiet. Hello? I said into the phone. Jody? Simon asked, back to normal voice. Yeah, is everything okay? I asked. Yeah, I was just making sure you weren't having any trouble finding a place. I know it's kind of out there, he said. No worries, I'm, I'm on my way. I think I'm 15 minutes out, I said. Do you have another mechanic with you today? I asked. He kind of stammered a bit and said, No, no, why? Oh, I thought I heard you talking to someone when I first picked up, I explained. Uh, must, been, must have been the radio or something, he said. Just checking to make sure you weren't lost. How far out is it? I asked. The map said it's not too far off the main road. You'll see, the address that I gave you is just for the driveway. You'll have to drive about a half mile to get back into the shop, he explained. I was starting to get a little nervous now. He didn't mention that it was in the middle of nowhere, or that I would have to drive off-road. My car was already having problems, bouncing around the country road sounded like the best way to make those problems worse. Still, I'd come this far. I still had hope that Simon was going to be my guy to get me through this and get it fixed. He could hear the apprehension in my voice and went right to saying all the stuff that I wanted to hear. How we checked the engine, make sure everything's flushed, and it perked me right up and got me on my way. I said bye and hung up the phone. I'd caught him lying though, a skill that I picked up during my breakup earlier that summer. He walked right into it and I couldn't tell why. Who'd he have with him that he didn't want me to know about? The road came up and I turned into what was a big dusty turnout along the road. From there, it was a little single rut dirt road that snaked off into the forest. My gut sank almost immediately. This was clearly not a road that led to a residence or business of any kind. There might be campsites back there, at the very most, and if not, piles of highway trash and shooting targets. I rolled my car through the lot and then onto that dirt road and bumped along for maybe five minutes, then brought my car to a stop. Even with the rising sunlight, there was nothing out here. No light in the distance, no big warehouse, no shop doors, nothing. I grabbed my phone and called Simon. Hello, he said. Hey, I don't see anything out here, like at all. How far did you say it was? I asked, knowing he had already said it a half a mile off the main road. Oh, about a half a mile. Well, I've already gone that far. I've been driving for a few minutes now, I interrupted him. Oh, well, you're almost here then. I don't log distance well. It might be further than a half mile, two miles maybe, but it has to be two miles at the most, he explained. I got kept twisting into a knot. Things were starting to not add up, and I was feeling a fool for being out in the woods at five in the morning. Unbelievably, I kept pressing on tapping my gas pedal and daring my car to break down at any damn moment. I go just a little bit further when my phone lights up. It's Simon calling again. I answer and bring my car to a slow roll. Hey, I can see your headlights, he exclaims. I feel a bit of confidence for just a split second, but then I remember the string of buzzwords that he used to get me out here. I'm realizing this guy has to be a bullshitter and a supremely good one at that. Anytime I expressed any kind of doubt, he started saying all the positive stuff that I needed to hear, and I just take him at his word from there. Yeah, just keep going, just back through this tree line and you're here. Why is your shop out here, Simon? I just asked him point blank. Oh, you, you know, you know, he started. There is no shop, is there? I asked in a measured tone. I was just gauging his reaction at this point to see how much of what he was saying was a lie. Then he did something unexpected. He hung up on me. I looked down in disbelief, scoffed, then froze. 
shadows flickered up ahead, just beyond my headlights. I slowly looked up, and to my horror, two, maybe three people were skulking through the tall grass, coming right at me. I screamed and hit the lock button, which was a relief, but I really needed to actually leave. I was panicking and wasting time. I grabbed my shift knob and slid it into reverse. Nothing happened. I could actually feel that nothing happened within transmission, or anywhere for that matter. When I hit the gas, the car still went forward. Not good. I shifted into reverse, and it set, and then I shifted back into reverse. Nothing still. I shifted back into drive. Still nothing. My eyes slowly split wide open as I realized I was stuck in neutral. The car problems I was having were about to get me murdered. I continued playing with the stick, played with the pedal, but nothing was working. The engine revved, but one of the gauges just spun circles. Everything else was totally still. Everything but those phantoms beyond the windshield. There were definitely three of them, and they fanned out and closed in at a sickening pace. I could feel bile steaming up my throat from my anxiety, from my desperation that led me out there, and tears began blurring my vision, but I knew the car was my only hope. I kept playing with the stick until it clicked. The car dumped into reverse and suddenly I was rolling backwards, the way I came. That dirt road was bumpy and uneven, but for the most part, it was a straight shot. I didn't even bother to use a mirror at first, just started jetting backwards as quickly as the car would take me. I could feel myself hitting the bumper here and there, but that was a small price to pay in the face of whatever these dudes had planned for me. Hey, get back here, we're gonna, we're gonna get you fixed up! I heard someone yell over my engine. Come on, you were so close! Another voice hollered. And then, nothing. I bucked back out into the main road. I shifted into drive and blasted towards town. Thankfully, the car was operating better than it ever had like that off-road session had corrected some of its own issues. Whatever the case, I was thanking God that I didn't get caught up in whatever the hell was going on back in those woods. It didn't even occur to me until I got back into town that I should probably call the police. I looked back into my messages and of course, Simon had blocked me. I figured he did the same with the phone, which was probably just some kind of burner. Thankfully, I got back home without any incident. I wanted to just go back to bed and sleep it all away. But I was so riled up from that experience. I ended up calling the police and they took a full report. I didn't do any kind of follow up or anything, but in my gut, I have a feeling that they found him. I keep an eye on the public bookings, people they pick up for various crimes, and I saw Simon amongst the names one week. Only time I ever saw it. The last names didn't match what he had before, but the whole Facebook account was just a lure, or so I believe, to get girls like me to go out into the woods. And the scariest part of it all is the guy almost got me. A few years ago, my husband and I turned on to the minimalist lifestyle. That is, if you don't know, retain a base minimum of belongings and don't over encumber yourself or your home with excessive amounts of stuff. We were knick-knack types, collectors, of whatever we thought was cool or even unique. Each windowsill in our house had different charms or minerals on display. No surface went undecorated the entire time that we were together, up until the introduction of this whole minimalism idea. Once we learned about it, we started selling all kinds of stuff. Facebook Marketplace became a passive form of income for us, but we still weren't fully satisfied. After the first year, all the knickknacks and small collections were gone, but we still felt like our house had way too much stuff. I sold a bunch of my crafts gear that I wasn't using anymore. My husband sold off tools and outdoor gear that he never used. We started to plan out what we were going to do with all the money that we saved as well. It was only like 500 bucks, but at the rate we were going, it would turn into a nice little chunk of change, more than enough to take some kind of nice vacation. We wanted to empty out even more of our belongings to see if we can get the money pile up to a grand. I was starting to sell some of my collector items, like antique chinaware, paintings, and things I largely considered just extra. My husband was on a mission to move his big 11-piece pearl drum kit. He played a bit in college. It was just one jam band that maybe had a half a dozen shows throughout his life. But for some reason, he always held on to that drum set. 
In the back of his mind, he always wanted to come back to it. But now, 10 years had gone by, and he hadn't so much as even picked up a stick during that whole hiatus. He realized that the drum kit was really just a dream, and was something that needed to go. We came up with a fair price and added it to our ever-evolving Facebook Marketplace offering. It was the highest mark item at the time, and was going to make more than double the amount of savings that we accumulated. We started to get some bites, but they were mostly just offers that my husband wasn't interested in entertaining. People wanted to make trades or payments, or just make lowball offers in general. My husband wasn't having it, stuck firm on the price. He knew what that kit was worth, and he'd already moved the price down significantly. The price was right, and now we just needed to wait for the right buyer. A week or so later, I was home alone. I had the day off. I was going through my normal morning routines. When I saw that I had a notification, someone had commented on the post about the drum set. He said it looked great, it had an amazing price, and would love to come take a look at it. He ended his comment by asking if he could send us a DM, to which I replied yes. I finished up what I was doing, the laundry or the dishes, something like that, then called my husband Mitchell. Hey, someone commented on your drum set, I said. Does he seem serious? He asked. I can't tell yet. He just commented on it. But he's the most serious person so far. He wants to come take a look at it. What time are you going to be home? Uh, I don't know. Mitchell stammered through the phone. He was a site manager, and they were putting up a new building. His hours during this project could vary. I'm not really sure. So if he's wanting to see it this morning or even afternoon, and you feel comfortable, go ahead and let him come by and take a look at it. The price is firm, though. This is just purely a quality check of the instrument, he explained very clearly. Sure, sounds good. Anything special I should mention? That it's been collecting dust for 10 years and may as well be brand new. I gotta go, though. I love you. I love you, too, I said, and then hung up. That was pretty much all I wanted to know. Make sure he was okay with the guy coming to look at it while he wasn't here, and if there was anything special that I should say. Other than that, we lived close to our neighbors, and I knew them pretty well. Also, had a decent amount of security within the house. A camera, a gun, that kind of thing. Robbery would be risky for anyone coming into our house. Or at least, so I thought. I hit the guy back on the post and told him that we were good to go, to which he followed up with a DM. He said his name was Ryan and that he was very excited about finding such a killer deal. I gave him a little background info on the drum set and that I would be home all day if he wanted to swing by and take a look at it. Ryan said he had some other things going on but could stop by around 1pm. That was just a few hours off and it suited me perfectly. I gave him our address. I told him to hit me back on messenger if anything changes or if he had any trouble finding the house. With that, he signed off and I resumed whatever I was doing. I actually looked up a YouTube video and decided that I was going to clean the drum set and I wanted to know the best and safest way to do so. It really had collected a healthy layer of dust. I wanted it looking good for whenever this guy came around. If Mitchell came home and I had the thing sold, boy, he'd be happy. After I got it dusted and shined up, I went and took a shower. I still had plenty of time before Ryan was supposed to show up. So I figured I'd get some more of my own chores done before I did the showing. I hopped out and started drying off. And then I just got this weird feeling. I couldn't place it at first, but it was like there was something that I didn't recognize beyond the bathroom window. We had one of those weird fog glass windows, so you could just see blurs and colors. No real definition through the glass. But there was something bright red in our driveway. At first, I thought it was maybe a neighbor or a delivery driver. I snuck into the bedroom and got dressed, as I quietly listened for anything weird. Footsteps around the side of the house, or maybe somebody already inside. I really didn't know what to expect, so I kept my phone handy just in case. I snuck out to the kitchen and looked out the window. There was a red hatchback parked in the driveway right behind my car. Okay, not the weirdest thing, but definitely unusual. Just as I'm getting ready to put on my sandals and ask the neighbors if they know anything, I see something. There's a man outside the living room window, essentially standing in the front yard, nowhere near his car. I keep an eye on him, and I don't really panic at first because he looks like, I'm not sure, maybe he's confused, lost? He looked like a little kid. 
It's really hard to describe. Definitely a full-grown man skulking around my property, though. But the look in his eyes was that of a child. It's weird. Still, I pulled up my phone and had my husband's number ready to dial. This guy was picking around our garden, mostly the herb patch where we grew a bunch of stuff in little squares near the front of the house. He touched just about everything and started helping himself to links of rosemary and thyme, handfuls of basil leaves, mint, even oregano. When he had this nice little stash, he took it back to his car and tucked it inside the console. I figured he was going to hop in the car and leave, but to my surprise, he went back to the area near the window and started fiddling with the hose. He got it unwrapped from the holder and turned the knob and then started watering the herb garden. He gave it a few spurts, then put the nozzle in his mouth and started drinking from it. He did this for like 10 minutes, no joke. After he was satisfied, he made sure the hose was untangled, then started walking over to his car. I kid you not, this man washed his entire hatchback in my driveway with that hose, with my own water. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but I was so perplexed with what I was watching, I didn't even bother to stop him. This guy was clearly crazy, or maybe he thought he was at a different house, but either way, it was my entertainment for that afternoon. When he was done rinsing his car and having a sip, he walked the hose back over and wrapped it up on the holder, then killed the water just as he found it. Okay, some semblance of normalcy, I guess. I'll never forget watching him pull his phone out and then putz around the front yard, Facebooking or whatever the hell he was doing, like he was just at his own house. Now, I really thought this was a case of mistaken address. He must be from out of town. Thought he was at his sister's house or something. Maybe he knocked while I was in the shower and I didn't answer. Now, he was just waiting around. But then it happened. He put the phone to his ear. Then my phone started vibrating. I was receiving a Facebook message call from Ryan, the guy who was supposed to come over in an hour or two. He was the weirdo looting my garden and helping himself to my hose. I shook my head and answered. Hello? I said. Hello, he said. Super weird start. Is everything good? We still on for later? I asked, staring right at the back of the guy's head. Yeah, yeah, I was actually going to ask, could we move up our meeting? A bunch of stuff came up later and it'd be easier for me to come take a look rather than later. Sure. How about noon? I asked, checking the clock. That was in 20 minutes. Perfect, he said, throwing his hands in the air. I'll be there in a bit. Thank you so much. And then we both hung up. It was the weirdest thing watching this guy lie, then react to his own lies. I was really put off by the whole thing and called my husband right away. I was not very pleased when he didn't answer the first, second, or third time that I tried to call his phone. They were in the middle of putting up these massive steel warehouse buildings and the phone service was really bad beneath all that metal paneling. Whatever the case, I don't like how everything was progressing. I'm looking down at my phone, deciding what to do, if I should call the police, when I hear him knock. I look up and there he is, peeking through the glass by the door. He gives me this creepy little wave. This was the exact kind of nightmare that I envisioned with my husband not being home. I stood there like a deer in headlights while Ryan continued knocking on the door. To my horror, he turned the knob and just pushed it open. Mitchell hadn't locked it behind him when he left this morning for work. I couldn't believe what I just let happen and that I failed to make any kind of call to the outside for help. Hi, he said in a slow, creepy voice. Are you Erica? Yes, I said, trying not to sound shaky or scared. Are you Ryan? Yeah, sorry, I've been knocking for a little while. Didn't mean to freak you out or anything, he explained. Yeah, it's just that we agreed to meet later at like 2 p.m. I wasn't expecting you this early or to be poking around my garden, I said. A slow smile split across his face. Oh, yeah, you saw that? <laughs> yes, I couldn't help myself, was all he said. That was it. No other explanation about showing up early or lurking around my property. I was becoming sick at this point. So, can I see that drum set? I have cash. That brought me back to the moment. I said, okay, it's right back here. 
Maybe this all is just a fluke. This guy is excited to get the kit for such a steal. I let him inside the rec room and the guy started going off about how pristine it was. Love the vintage look. Love how preserved it was. All that good stuff. This guy was on his hands and knees inspecting every little hinge on the frame. Then he starts telling me about the old band that he used to play in. How they went by the wayside after the frontman and songwriter got locked up for selling drugs. He was just a fill-in guy for a while, taking gigs as a sub for other bands on tour, or local acts around town who just needed him for one night. He got to learn a lot about genres and what he liked to play during those years. And suddenly, I realized this guy had been talking to me for like 40 minutes, going on and on and on about his whole life story. He hadn't so much as turned an eye on the drums since he started talking, and now it was just all about him. I was getting that weird vibe again. I didn't know what to do. Ryan was making himself at home, walking from room to room, giving himself his own little tour, and complimenting everything that he found. I couldn't tell if this guy was just high or crazy. Either way, he would continuously kept giving me these creepy little glances over his shoulder. Look, I, I have a lot to do, I finally said. Do you want to buy the drum set? That's what you're here for, right? Yes, yes, he said. The drum set. It's perfect. I want it. He pulled a bunch of money out of his pockets. Disorganized bills crumbled and stuffed at random. He counted out the amount that he needed and kept asking me over and over and over again what the amount was. It was a nice round number. I really couldn't figure out why he needed me to repeat it so many times. He gave me the money and then started breaking the kit down and then schlucking it out to his car. He talked the entire time like he never took a breath continually talking about what he was going to do with his drums and the plans for his weekend. It was like this guy thought he knew me or something. After he got the drums loaded up, he actually tried to come back in our house, and thank God my husband got home around this time. Ryan's entire demeanor changed the second Mitchell's truck rolled into the driveway, like he'd been caught out or something. He went from looking like a curious kid to menacing and troubled. He didn't speak to my husband at all, just simply said thanks, climbed into his car, and left. I never heard from Ryan again, and thankfully haven't seen him either. The whole scenario was probably nothing, but I can't shake the feeling that I dodged something scary that afternoon. In hindsight, it just seemed like he was probing, seeing how far he could take the situation before I would start to react. I misjudged everything from start to finish, and felt like a dummy for putting myself in danger. I guess if you're going to make online sales, that's just the name of the game. When I was younger and more inclined to chase paper at literally all hours of the night, I took a side gig as an Uber driver. This was on top of my full-time job in retail. Working a counter and making sales just didn't have the payout that I needed at the time. And I wasn't smart enough to just find a better job or simply negotiate a raise. Instead, I did what so many of our working youth do today and picked up a second job. I lived in this big city, drove a nicer car that I love zipping around in. So working Uber made a lot of sense in my mind. This was around 10 years ago, so the company had successfully launched and was making waves all over the country. You'd hear about people clearing six-figure salaries, all just from giving people rides around their community. People I'd talked to, just in passing, all told me the same thing. It was easy money that you could make hand over fist. I can't really tell you that it wasn't that. I pulled a decent amount in this little side hustle, but I wasn't doubling my income like I thought I would. It also put me in this new level of exhaustion because I had to sacrifice sleep in order to have more productive Uber shifts. This meant I was going all the time. I'd get off the retail job around 5 p.m., grab a quick bite to eat, and then off to work Uber until about 2 in the morning. Anything after that time, I quickly learned was just riffraff. And this was back when Uber didn't have quite the protocol that it does now. It wasn't unheard of for some pretty wild stuff to happen in the backseat of these cars. Fast forward a little bit, and I'm like six months into this new working world. I've gotten the swing of working double shifts, where the higher yield areas are for pickups, and how to make a quick turnaround in both drop-offs and getting back down to the downtown areas. If you took the wrong road, you'd come up on the opposite side, where a lot of commercial and business parks were. 
You'd have to make these weird loops that took extra time and gas to do so. There was a hospital downtown that I would periodically idle nearby, as it had serious real estate in the form of parking lots. I could just rest here and check my phone, not have to worry about the hustle and bustle of traffic, even catch a few Z's if I needed to. There were also various fast food joints and convenience stores nearby, everything to keep me in the game. Occasionally, I'd drink a Red Bull or something, but it wasn't that often. Alas, I found myself at the end of an exhaustive cycle. I was definitely about to reach my limit. One night, during that red line period, I did my usual routine where I pulled into the hospital while waiting for a client. It was an unusually slow night, and I was expecting lots of passengers, so I didn't really know what to do. I held out that I'd make more money later on in that night, so went and got an energy drink from a vending machine in the lobby. It didn't matter. I plopped back down in the driver's seat, turned on my favorite playlist, and then passed out just right there. I wasn't asleep for very long, but it was a deep, catatonic rest. You know the one. Mouth wide open, drooling, mouth breathing, looking my absolute worst. There is one thing that I dislike more, and that's the feeling of waking up when I shouldn't have been asleep. My brain starts to immediately overcompensate. I can't make any connections despite all the sparks. I can't remember where I am, who I am, what I'm doing. There are times when teachers would catch me sleeping in high school. I'd be so startled when they woke me up. I couldn't even speak proper English. Just make weird noises and get silent, then literally have to remember how to make it all make sense. It was one of those times. I remember kicking myself awake because my head was at this weird funny angle. I made this kind of groaning sound as I snapped back into the waking world. I was still inside my car. It was still nighttime. Hell, it was the same playlist coming through the speakers. I peeked up at the clock and saw that I was only out for maybe 15 minutes. I took a deep breath through my nose and then settled into the seat. A cat nap was actually perfect, allegedly giving us more energy than a longer nap. I checked my phone and saw that I didn't miss anything, but there was a person that I could swoop up nearby and make a few bucks off. I took another swig of my drink, checked my mirrors, and then went to shift into park. I stopped though. There was something off in my rearview mirror. If I wasn't mistaken, there was a person sitting right behind me in the middle seat. We make eye contact. I whirl around and sure enough, plain as day, there's a man just sitting not 12 inches from me. He gets a little smile across his face and just kind of nods, like he was acknowledging that I'd been asleep. It almost looked like a little hello on his end. I really didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to start screaming at him to get out. Another part of me wanted to put on this front, act real tough, and then the other part of me just wanted to ask what he was doing inside my car. That's when I looked down and saw the Uber app open in his phone. I remember the sticker in my window that I was parked outside of a hospital. This guy probably exited one of these buildings, was wandering to a through street while he booked a ride. Then he just happened to see me. For whatever reason, seeing his phone helped my brain regain just a little coherence. And that put the panic to rest. So I simply said, Hi, what are you doing in my car? He didn't respond for a moment, just kind of looked at the floor and then the ceiling, anywhere but directly at me. I gestured to his phone and then continued to talk. Are you looking for a ride or something? I asked. He nodded. Okay, he's at least halfway normal. I got on at length for a bit, pulling my seatbelt on. Then I explained to him what I explained to you. I worked two jobs, I was tired, and I just happened to fall asleep. I said I'd be happy to give him a ride in exchange for a good review, one that wouldn't say that I was sleeping inside my car. We both shared a laugh on that one. I'm trying to get downtown, he said. He pointed back Jackson Drive. A main drag through the area. Where? I asked. He then gave me these loose directions, but said it was pretty close to an old music venue that had shut down a few years before. I was familiar with that area, so I just started the route. We made a little small talk, mostly about myself and how I'd fallen asleep. This guy's name was Donovan. He said that when he got in the car, he went to speak, but saw that I was snoring, so just decided to wait. Well... I appreciate you not being a weirdo, I said. I was about to freak out before I saw your Uber app. Then it hits me. 
This guy and I aren't actually linked up. He never ordered a ride through the app, and I haven't logged picking anyone up. I take a quick glance at him in the rear view and say, Hey, I just realized this ride isn't registered. Can you find me on the app really quickly? That's when the guy scoffs, looks out the window and says, Oh, I'm not paying for this. I laugh, to which he just stays silent. It's getting a little awkward now. I glance into the back real quick, realize the mistake that I've now made. This guy isn't dressed like a professional, no business casual, if you catch my drift. He's filthy, he's got torn up clothes, he's only got one shoe on. His face is dirty and dark from sun exposure. And there's this grimy backpack next to him. He's homeless, he has to be. While I was asleep, some drifter hanging around the hospital must have just climbed into my car, thinking he'd be able to sleep in it or something. I noticed it on my second glance though. Donovan is wearing a bracelet, the paper kind that they use in the hospital for discharge. This guy probably OD'd behind a trash can, got Narcan'd, and is now getting a free ride back to his crack house. All because I couldn't keep my eyes open. I shake my head, hit my blinker, and then start guiding my car towards the next exit. Yo, where are you going? He asked from the back. I told you where we're going. I'm not driving you across town for free, dude. You're lucky I don't even call the cops. I countered. I took my phone out of the cup holder beside me just to show him that I wasn't messing around. Yeah, Donovan said. You're lucky I don't unlace my shoe and strangle you with it. Before I could even blink, I felt his crusty, calloused hands sneak around the headrest and wrap around my throat. Instinctually, I took one hand off the wheel and tried to break his grip, but I couldn't do it. I barely got a finger underneath his palm to create just this little space to breathe. Panic started to set in. As I watched a minute tick by on the clock, I tried to get this guy off of me. I could hear his raspy breath just behind me. The smell coming off his hands and mouth was completely disgusting. This dude definitely hadn't showered in at least a week or more. Then it finally hits me. I had to get him off of me. I check my mirrors and see that I'm alone on this stretch of the highway. I then firmly slam on my brakes. I was belted in, but dipshit Donovan behind me wasn't as lucky. He slammed forward, right into my seat, which created a little space in his arms. I yanked with my free hand, broke his grip, and then gunned the car over the shoulder. At this point, Donovan has recovered and is now trying to grab me again, but I'm not letting that happen twice. We're in a bit of a standoff now. I put the car in the park and put the hazards on. I say to hell with it. This has already gone too far. I dial 911, hit the call button, and press the phone to my ear. He starts to trip out, makes a lot more threats, but starts to get out of my car now. That's when I notice he's holding a purse, a pretty nice one at that. He grumbles a little bit, shoulders his backpack in that purse, then steps out into the cool night air. He then proceeds to start walking down the shoulder, down the exit ramp and back into the city. I hear dispatch in my ear and I realize I can't just let this asshole go. I start rattling off everything that just happened to me, where I'm at and where the perp is located. As I'm describing the scene, the dispatcher gets quiet for a second maybe even mutes me, then comes back with new information just a minute later. She says my report matches an earlier one from that exact hospital that I was parked at. Apparently, old Donovan had been admitted exactly as I figured, and during his stay, he became incoherent, agitated, and realized that he wasn't being supervised. He unhooked himself from the machine, put his clothes back on, then just exited the hospital, but not before stealing a purse out of one of the rooms in his wing. She noticed not long after it went missing and got with hospital security and they got on the cameras. It didn't take very long to see this guy strolling out the front door with that woman's purse in hand. From there, he starts running, as seen on the footage. He was probably paranoid about getting caught now that he'd exited the hospital. He zigzagged through the parking lot for a bit before coming upon my car, which was on and idling. D-bag Donovan thought he was gonna be able to steal my car up until he saw me sleeping in it. From there, he just snuck into the back and hid from any potential hospital security. Needless to say, Donovan's night went south after he got out of my car. I told dispatch where I was and where he was headed, 
and then even followed him down the exit ramp. I didn't make it two blocks before a cop swooped in, blasted him with the lights and siren, and threw him in a pair of cuffs. The phone that I'd seen in his hand was the woman's phone. He'd found it in her purse. He was trying to figure out how to order an Uber in the event that I didn't wake up. It just happened to be the perfect guys in the moment. I gave a statement to the officers who hauled him off. I suspected he spent a couple of weeks drying out in a jail cell. I probably don't need to say this, but remember to lock your car doors, people. I'm a 46-year-old male, and while I wouldn't say I've had a life of danger and intrigue, I have worked a handful of unusual jobs. I've traveled a good bit and have some interesting life experiences. I've also inherited some strange traits from my father, which attracts weirdos, crazies, and the troublemakers. I don't know if it's my appearance or just some sort of aura, but if I'm in a crowd and there's a mentally unstable homeless person in the vicinity, you can damn well bet that they're going to approach me. When I tell people this, they often think that I'm kidding or exaggerating, but those who are around me long enough will eventually find out that it's all true. Over the years, I've amassed a collection of stories, most of them being humorous, strange, and just interesting tales. But I do have a few stories that are just downright scary. Today, I would like to share one of those with you. On a final note before I begin, I've included some details in this story that may seem unrelated to the incident itself. My reasoning for doing so is not only because I think the setting and context are significant, but also because I've got more stories from this awful period in my life. This will make a lot more sense once you hear the story. Now let the fun begin. Back in the early 2000s, I was living in the city of Pittsburgh and worked as a credit manager for a rental company. A few years prior, I had foolishly dropped out of college and was living in an apartment that I couldn't really afford. Bills were starting to pile up. I needed to find a job with a decent wage. A friend contacted me and told me that he was leaving his job. The company would be looking for a replacement. When he first told me about the job, I naively thought the company rented out furniture and appliances to businesses just for events, and once they were finished renting the items, they would conveniently be returned. How hard could that be? Boy, was I in for a rude awakening. After I got hired, I found out that the company's business model was to rent to own, and they preyed on welfare recipients and people with low incomes. The cheap rental rates for furniture, TVs, stereos, and appliances were enticing to those who couldn't afford such things. But unbeknownst to the renters, the items would take years to pay off. These people would end up paying 10 times more than what the item was really worth. My job title was just a fancy name for a repo man. If someone couldn't pay or refused to pay, it was my job to hunt them down and repossess those items. Oddly, out of all the insane situations that I'd encountered while out repoing in the projects, this occurrence actually took place behind the store on my day off. It's important to note that generally, when you see a rent-to-own store, it's either or near a rough neighborhood. Usually, they're located conveniently near one of those payday loan stores or a token liquor store. The shopping plaza where we were located wasn't in that bad of an area but it was closest to the shopping center to the nearby projects. I'd heard a rumor that the plaza's large parking lot was a hotbed for drug activity. And while it wasn't that uncommon to see multiple lit up police cars in the lot, I never knew if it was just drug bust or maybe just crackhead shoplifting. Now, being this was my day off, work was the last place that I wanted to be, but the shitty van that I drove at the time was having engine troubles. So when my shift ended on the previous night, I left the van in the back of the store and then got a ride from a coworker who lived nearby. The plan was to get a ride back to the store in the late morning, bring my tools and work on the van and hopefully, hopefully get it back up and running. I remember that it was actually a beautiful summer day, which is pretty rare in Pittsburgh. So I was happy at least that I didn't have to work out in the rain. The back of the store looked like your typical loading dock area that you would see at any shopping plaza throughout the US. The plaza itself was fairly large and roughly 300 yards long. Across from the loading docking area was where all these stores kept their dumpsters. Beyond the dumpsters, there's overgrown weeds and bushes, then railroad tracks, and eventually a wooded area that ran along the Monongahela River. 
Our store was located smack dab in the middle of that shopping center. I ended up getting there a little later than I wanted to. My van was high enough that I didn't need to jack it up. So I threw down some cardboard and just got immediately to work. There were some preliminary things that I had to do before I got to whatever the real actual problem was. So I didn't really get things apart until by afternoon. And by then, it was moving back and forth between the driver's seat and the space between the van. Hours ticked by, and soon, the sun was starting to go down. I don't remember exactly how long I was under there or had been working, but I remember that I was in the driver's seat, trying to get the van started. At this point, I thought I had it pretty much pegged. I was pulling myself out from underneath the van, and I heard distant running footsteps. I stood up and saw this skinny dude about 75 yards away from me, running toward me. Aside from the immediate thinking that it was an odd place to be out for a jog, I didn't think much more of it. As he got closer to me, I nodded and said hi. But when he looked at me, it was the look of pure fear and panic. This man wasn't jogging, he was full on sprinting. He was younger than I initially thought. Maybe he was in his mid-twenties and he was casually dressed, but they definitely weren't clothes that you'd wear while jogging. Completely confused, I just stood there, watched him run toward the dumpsters and then disappear. While it was odd, you usually don't see people in the back of the plaza. I was used to seeing weirdos and the occasional river people, or just homeless people, who camped out near the riverbank. I shrugged it off and decided to get back to work. Around 30 seconds later, I hear footsteps once again. I see another man running toward me. As he approached, I could tell this man was bigger and maybe in his late 30s. He had a beard and was wearing a hat. There's something about him that was a lot more intimidating though. I'm six foot two and at the time, I weighed about 215 pounds. People often said that I looked intimidating, to which you kinda had to at the job that I was at, but it only took one look from this man to know that he wasn't somebody to fuck with. Once he was within about 10 yards from me, he yelled, Where is he? Where'd he go? Without hesitation, I quickly pointed towards the dumpsters. Looking back, I felt like a pushover, just doing what this stranger told me to do. But there was this assertiveness about this guy that just made me instantly comply. This is where shit starts to get crazy. Together with the bearded man walking just slightly behind me, I began to head over toward the dumpsters, which were maybe 25 yards away. Thinking by now that skinny guy was long gone, probably deep in the wooded area near the river. I was just going to point out in the general direction to where he ran, but as we approached the dumpsters, I noticed a crouching figure behind one of them, and all of a sudden I hear, Get the fuck out here now! When I turn around, I saw that bearded man. He was now a few feet away from me, aiming a gun directly at Skinny Guy. Dumbfounded, I just stood there, frozen, as if I couldn't process what was all going on. Skinny guy stands up and hesitantly walks towards the bearded man, who grabs him and shouts to him immediately, Get the fuck on the ground! He throws him onto the pavement. I was soon snapped out of my frozen state by the sound of screeching tires. At the opposite end of the plaza, maybe 150 yards away, I turned to see a pickup fishtailing around the bend, headed straight for us at full speed. It was at this moment I realized I needed to get the hell out of this situation instead of just standing there with my mouth hanging open. I ran back toward my van and just hid behind it. I see the pickup truck slam on its brakes just a few feet away from Skinny Guy on the ground. Two armed men get out of the truck. Another armed man jumps down from the back of the truck. All the men were yelling angrily and every other word being fuck. I could hear one of them say to the Skinny Guy, Oh, you fucked up, man. You fucked up. Two of the men grab Skinny Guy and yank him up off the ground. They drag him to the back of the pickup. And at gunpoint, one of them yells, Get in the fucking truck! They made Skinny Guy lie down, face first, on the truck bed. At this point, you can no longer see him. Two of the men get inside the cab, while the other two, still with guns drawn, climb back into the truck bed. As they're about to leave, the two men in the truck bed hunched down and try to look less conspicuous. While I could no longer see their guns, it was obvious by the way that their arms were extended. They still had their guns aimed at the skinny guy's head. They sped off and disappeared around that bend. 
For a split moment, I just stood there in disbelief, wondering what the hell I just witnessed. It all happened so fast. After the bearded man drew his gun, it seemed like from his perspective, I no longer even existed. Who the hell were those guys? Were they members of some criminal organization or drug dealers? Maybe they were even undercovers for the DEA. I thought of the possibilities that maybe they were even dirty cops. You'd think if they were law enforcement or DEA, they would have at least announced it and talked like cops or maybe even used handcuffs. Yet if they were criminals, they sure seemed organized, didn't seem to care about waving their guns around either, nor did they care about the fact that I was witnessing all of it. Shortly after I had these thoughts and they ran through my head, I ran into the store to tell my coworkers what just happened. I honestly can't remember who was all there that day, but I distinctly remember two of my co-workers who were there. We'll call them Sarah and Mark to protect their identities. Sarah was the receptionist. Mark was the store manager. When I told them everything that just happened, they were both said something to the effect of, damn, that's crazy. Yet it was like they couldn't comprehend the severity of what really happened. It wasn't like they completely shrugged it off, but they didn't seem to be as shocked as I was. It was absolutely wild to me the difference in our reactions. They were just pretty much focused on closing down. I was out back, front line to the chaos. It was a perfect dichotomy. I thought maybe it was because everyone in this godforsaken place had become so numb to the insanity. Used to hearing crazy stories from the so-called road dogs like myself. Honestly, they probably weren't all that surprised to hear the people behind the store were waving guns around. After seeing their underwhelmed reactions, I regained my composure and went back outside to finish working on my van. About a half an hour later, I saw two men slowly walking behind the dumpster area where the pavement ended and the weeds began. Occasionally, they would stop and look to the weeds and bushes and eventually made their way onto the railroad tracks, still looking as if they were searching for something. They weren't there for very long and after a few minutes of looking around, they just walked away and disappeared. After that, I never heard or saw from any of those guys ever again. To this day, I don't know why I didn't report any of this incident to the police. I guess a part of me suspected they were somehow involved. My theory was the armed men were undercover cops, either police or DEA. They'd staged a drug deal and were running surveillance on one. And then they tried to arrest the skinny guy or else maybe he grew suspicious and that's why he fled the scene. After fleeing, the skinny guy stashed or tossed the drug somewhere hence the guy who were looking around afterwards. That seems to be the most plausible scenario. Yet another part of me has some doubts about it all. Something about the whole thing was just off. And while it's not like the incident haunts my conscience on a daily basis or anything, sometimes I do get this guilty feeling, as if I ratted that skinny guy out and sent him to his death. Unfortunately or fortunately, I'll never know. I ended up quitting that job almost a year later. I worked there for three years, and toward the end, I began to notice that I'd become very cynical, mean, and depressed. I also became a heavy drinker, among other things, and I knew I had to get out of that place and find a new path, which thankfully eventually I did. Anyhow, I've tried to bury and forget most of these memories from that time in my life, but there were a few repo incidents that I can't forget like the time I almost had to jump out of a second story window, or the time I had to hide from a customer's psychotic husband. If there's anyone interested in these stories, leave a comment. Life is pretty busy these days, so it may take me some time, but I enjoy writing and have plenty to write about. Thanks for listening. Back when I was married, and way more appropriately aged for the job, I was a bartender in a pretty rural community. The place itself was called the Red Bear. It was kind of a local hangout for the old timers, the day laborers, and really anyone without drama. We'd have live music on the weekends, a fish fry on Friday, all the little quaint small town stuff that we do to drum up the business. I was one of the few women that worked there. The Red Bear had been the place to be in our town for something like 40 years. My mom had been one of the OG servers and bartenders back in the day. So it was kind of a cool experience for me, tracing the same steps, completing the same duties as my mom had done for a few decades prior. 
We didn't have any stake in the ownership or anything, but our history there made it feel special and super sentimental. I look forward to going to work pretty much every day. This place had a history though. Weird things happened because of it too, or at least I think so. And honestly, my firsthand experiences are pretty convincing. Because the place was a bar, some of us would be there well into the early hours in the morning, either cleaning up or finishing up some other closing duties. The building was very old, all brick and creaky lumber, had a lot of shadowy corners. The place was creepy, especially in the dark. If you were alone, it was extra unsettling, even for me. The first time I'd heard about anything, about the ghosts or whatever is in there, I heard it from my mom. I was just a little girl at the time, maybe 11 or 12. My mom would come home from work, absolutely terrified, all pale, wide-eyed, and covered in sweat. It took some prodding, but eventually, she told me some of the stories. This would set the stage for me, as by the time I got a job there, it was firmly established that the Red Bear was definitely haunted in my mind. There were really only rumors, nothing concrete about its history. Someone had been murdered there over a gambling dispute. A man caught his wife cheating with the regular, so showed up at the bar with the 12 gauge, murdered every patron in the building. A disgruntled woman who had worked in the kitchen allegedly poisoned much of the food one morning and sent multiple people to the hospital and a couple to the morgue. Again, all of these were rumors. There was very little evidence to support any of these stories. The only weird thing that might suggest one of them happened was the shotgun murder. At night when the lights were low and a band was playing, you could see glistening things in the walls. We thought they were just glitter for a long time, but one year, when a wall repair was being made, the contractor told us it definitely wasn't glitter, but bird shot embedded in the wood. Sure enough, someone had discharged the shotgun in the main room at least a couple of times in its lifetime. Whatever the case, I found myself on one of those nights, alone and closing in the dark. The building was so old that you could hear the electricity humming in the wires if it was quiet enough. Eerie. It had a grand walk-up staircase that led to the front room and then spilled into the main dining room. To the left was a smaller dining room, and then the bar beyond that. Directly behind the main room was the kitchen, a dish pit area, and then some linen storage. There was a back door that led to a path that you could take to the dumpster as well. There was also a stairwell that went down into the basement. I want you to envision the dankest, creepiest hole in the ground imaginable. Fill it with shoddy woodwork, concrete, a few buzzing light bulbs, and a series of walk-in coolers and a walk-in freezer. We kept extra kegs of beer, dry storage, all kinds of random things down there. An employee could find themselves running into the basement three, four, maybe even five times in a busy shift. If you were one of the closers, or had to do the ordering at all, you could spend a few hours down there just getting it organized. It was a Sunday. The place was a complete disaster. I had spent the first half of closing just trying to get it all cleaned up. I was not starting to do the restock just yet. This involved multiple trips to and from the basement getting bulk napkins, ketchup, beer bottles, you name it. I was hauling it all up for the following day service. Anyone who works in the service industry knows what I mean. Sunday evening is like breathing life back into a corpse, trying to keep it reanimated through another week. The business from Friday and Saturday just eats up any stock that you might have. Like I said, this place was a haunt to me by reputation, but as an employee, I didn't really think about it very often. Unless something weird was actually happening, it was never really in my mind. We weren't shaking the moment that we clocked in or peeking into rooms before we entered them. It was a job, so we focused. I was on my third or fourth trip up when I heard it. Footsteps in the kitchen. I was stocking the beer coolers in the bar. There was a straight shot from my position, through the bathroom hallway and into the first portion of the kitchen. It sounded like someone's sneakers were sticking to the tile and then descended the stairs into the basement. I looked up and listened, but then I remembered that I was alone. I shrugged and figured it was the ghost getting settled in for the night. There's really nothing to do about it except for hurry up and just get the hell out of here. I had a system though. If shit got too weird before I finished, I would just leave and come back in the morning to get it all done. I don't mess around with the dead or whatever the hell haunts this place. 
As I put the last beer in the fridge, I can hear one of the walk-in coolers open. The pull handles are these big jingly metal things, so they're loud as hell when you yank on them. I stood still for a moment, but everything went quiet. Just as I started to break down the cardboard of the beer boxes, I hear that cooler slam shut downstairs, and it felt like it shook the whole building when it did. Alright, it's go time. I start speeding through every little job that I have left. I didn't even bother counting my tips. Just tossed them in my purse and saved it for when I get home. Sinks are drained, things are closed and secure. I just need to lock the back door and hit the lights in the kitchen. At this point, 10 or 15 minutes had passed and nothing more had really happened. The bar kind of reverted back to its normalcy, so I disarmed my paranoia that I had from earlier. I was still on edge, but I did my last walkthrough, found a few things that needed to organize or fill in the back. I made the mistake of putting my purse down, as well as the bank bag and the keys for the door. All of a sudden, I was back in work mode, and soon I found myself running downstairs to grab a box of soda for the machine that was upstairs, as well as to turn off the lights. The owner of the building was adamant about never being left on because the wiring was so faulty. He said it was like begging for a structure fire. I could see the light switch at the bottom of the stairs. I could even see the stack of soda boxes. I didn't see anything prowling and I couldn't hear any more footsteps. So I threw my caution to the wind and went down those goddamn stairs. When I reached the bottom, I saw the last thing that I wanted to see. The door to the biggest walk-in was wide open and it's halfway down the basement, in the middle between the first walk-in and the freezer on the end. Whatever, the lights are on, I'm already down here, so I walked over, grabbed the handle, and before I could yank it shut, something moved to my left, so I instinctually turned to look at it. At first, there was nothing there, just the kegs and random bags of cleaning towels stuffed in between them. Then, I see a shadow pass against the wall, cast from the bowl behind the door that I'm holding. I don't have time to react or run like I want to. What I would describe as a big, menacing shadow person quickly stepped around the edge of the door and into view. Instead of running backwards, I just fell sideways into the walk-in. It was the quickest way to create space in my head, so I just fell in that direction completely out of panic. We had those plastic blinds that try to keep the cold air inside the unit and they flapped closed after I fell through them. I scrambled backwards as the door slammed shut. I stood there for the next five or maybe even 10 minutes. Honestly, I don't know how long it was. I just listened to complete destruction behind that steel door. I could hear kegs banging around, slamming into the walls, cans rolling around, boxes tearing. It sounded like a war zone. The door periodically shook with some of the louder bangs. I began to tremor too. I didn't have a coat and holding temperature down there was 36 degrees. After a while it got quiet and I couldn't stand to be there any longer. I moved to the door, pressed my ear against it and just listened. Nothing. I gently pushed the handle in but the door didn't budge. Something was holding it closed from the outside. I got scared at first, assuming it was the shadow thing that I saw. But as I stood there, shivering for another 10 minutes. I remember all the kegs banging around. Surely, if enough of them were lying on the floor, they could be pinning the door closed. Suddenly, the reality that I might freeze to death settles on my shoulders, like the first faint layer of the frost, the frost that'll kill me. Panic gets a stranglehold on me. I start throwing myself against the door, but again, it doesn't budge a hair. That doesn't deter me, though. I push and push and push until I realize that I'm screaming louder than I ever had before. Veins bulging out of my face and neck. I swear I could feel my teeth moving because I was screaming that hard. Only after I gave up and tried to catch my breath did the thing finally start to crack open. Sure enough, as I pushed, I could feel things moving on the other side of the door, shifting around. When there was enough space, I poked my head out to find a couple of kegs and cans holding the door closed. The whole basement was a complete disaster, like a tornado ripped through there. I climbed out of the walk-in and slammed it closed and booked it over to the stairwell. There's no way in hell that I was going to stay and clean any of that up. I'll just explain in the morning what had happened. I figured that they'd understand. 
everyone has had weird experiences that worked there before. Maybe not quite on this level. Only my mom has ever told me stories that are this scary. I cast one more glance behind me as I turned the lights off and went up the stairs. I swear to God I saw that shadow thing step out from the furthest back corner, as if it manifested itself right before my eyes. Then it was dark, and I was sprinting up to freedom. I grabbed my purse and all my stuff and hightailed it through the main room and down the staircase. When I got there the next morning, everything had already been cleaned up. Everyone was desperate to know what the hell happened. I explained my story and everyone just nodded, as if they expected it. With the level of destruction that I left behind, they figured it had to be something drastic, either a robbery or a ghost. Thankfully, nothing like that ever happened to me again. But I also never let myself be alone there anymore. A year before COVID hit, I got hired at a call center way downtown, like inner city. We worked taking calls for a roadside assistance company that will remain anonymous. Although honestly, the last time I looked them up, I couldn't even find a website for them. They may or may not even be in business anymore. Anyway, because of the nature of our industry, our office operated 24 hours a day. It wasn't this big private call center, but just a ground level corner unit in a commercial office block. We shared a building with 10 or 12 other businesses. All of them would operate during normal hours. At 5 p.m., the whole parking lot cleared out, and the only light on would be coming from our place. It had no signage and a keypad on the door for around the clock access. We would trade shifts at 4 p.m., midnight, and 9 a.m., usually in two-man teams, sometimes three or four throughout the week or on holiday weekends. The overnight shift was typically just one guy, Benji, but holiday weekends, they'd put two of us from midnight to 9 a.m. So there we were, I think it was Labor Day weekend, and it's Benji and I handling the phones on a Friday overnight shift. I didn't ever mind getting these shifts because honestly, I love working with the guy. He was a little older than me and has some of the craziest stories that I've ever heard. He grew up inner city, kind of a criminal, but got cleaned up and was looking to break into the music business. I was into drawing and illustration, and he liked looking at whatever I was working on at the time. We'd just hang out and bullshit until the sun came up. We'd even troll people on the phone if they were spamming or dodging the line. Looking back now, it was a lot of fun in those dark hours, and a lot of daydreaming. One night we ordered Domino's, split a pizza and some cine sticks. Legendary meal for a couple of call room guys. Little did I know in my early 20s that I was slowly becoming lactose intolerant. So all of that cheese and butter would send my stomach and my colon into hysterics. We ate around midnight, talked and then worked until about 1.30 a.m. And then I started catching the gurgles. By 2 a.m. I knew something was about to happen, out of one end or the other. I clued Benji into what was going on so he could watch the phone line for me. I slipped out the door, which was the only way in and out of the office. There was no secondary escape, no back door, just a big panel window in the back. In hindsight, the office almost seemed illegal. Lots of things within the operation were just shady as hell. As you can imagine, because there's so many office units, we also share a single pair of bathrooms. They were on the ground floor, and they were external as in the doors were open to the public. Everyone who worked there had a key to either open one door or the other. They were all the way down one of these stretch of businesses, about 40 feet, and then around a corner and tucked into a little back nook of a second floor. This kept them out of sight so no randoms or weirdos tried to use them and or vandalize them. I go in, struggling with my unbeknownst to me digestive issues, and then wash up. As I'm looking into the mirror, I hear someone push on the door from the outside. I laugh and yell something out, as I assumed it was Benji just messing with me. There was no response except for a couple of hard whacks against the metal. Weird, but I had been in there forever, so again, I think Benji is just being funny. I open the door. There's no one there. I step out and wander down the little hallway, but instead of continuing on to the office, I hook left and go out to a small secondary parking lot. It's out in the back. It's where the dumpsters are, as well as this little outdoor area. 
As I step into the parking lot, I hear feet slapping the asphalt, running at me from some direction. Now I know something weird is going on. I turn and bolt back for the office. I'm sprinting and about to fall face first into the cement, but catch myself on the handle just in time. I start to punch in the code and immediately get it wrong. It's flashing red. I have to wait five seconds for it to reset. All I can hear is my heart, my breathing, and these flapping feet out there in the dark. I jiggle the handle and scream for Benji. I'm banging on the door. Suddenly I realize I've switched positions. Now it's me outside being the scary chaotic thing, and I can see him through the blinds looking over his shoulder. He's on the phone, which is flashing red on three ports. It apparently picked up while I was handling my business. I turn and start banging on the glass, begging him to get up. I see him hit the hold button, swing the chair around and rush over to the door. He pushes it open, I spill in, and he slams it right shut again. Breathless, I tell him what had just happened to me. I'm expecting Benji to freak out, lock the extra bolt on the door, and tell me to call the police. Nope, the exact opposite happened. He rolls up his sleeves and steps out into the cool night air. The person was lurking around at the end of the building, where it turned for the bathroom nook. They were barefoot, drug-addled, your average homeless fella in our city. I watched from the threshold of the office door as Benji pigeon chest this guy and gave him the stern get the hell out of here stick, and sure enough, got the guy to tuck tail and run. What I perceived as a serial killer, Benji immediately pegged for just a hobo tweaker. Like I said, he was a hard ass inner city dude. He had a colorful history, a bit of a rap sheet. I was very grateful to have him by my side every time shit went down in that office. We ran into that lurking creep a few more times and honestly, had all kinds of crazy experiences while working there. There was a 7-Eleven right across the street that would get robbed, roadside calls where people were shot, even one of our drivers, and also a time we helped a guy escape a cult compound by towing his car off of their property. I've never told these stories online, so if anyone is interested in them, just leave me a comment. Cheers. When I was in 8th grade, my dad splurged and bought his dream car. I was much too young at the time to drive, so I don't remember any of the specs. But the gist is, he purchased a convertible BMW Z4. It was silver through and through, with chrome and glass for the accents. It was an absolutely beautiful machine, and had a lot of power underneath that hood. Well, that first year that he bought it, he wanted to go on a road trip with me. A way to celebrate, a way to bond a way to break in the new ride. He even said he'd give me some driving instructions. All of it sounded fun, so when school got out that summer, we packed up and hit the road for about a week total. We couldn't fit much more in the way of clothes and supplies in the trunk and the back seat. If you've never seen one, Google it. Z4s are very small cars, but it was fun, and we hit the road with a good idea of where we were going, as my dad and I had been loosely planning our trip for about a month or two. We'd go north at first, then shoot over west before coming down the coastal highway through California. We jammed music, talked about life, told stories from the good old days, typical father-son stuff. We even told riddles and jokes, some of my favorite pastimes. We saw all manner of beautiful terrain, mostly canyons and valleys throughout the southwest and the Pacific Northwest. It was cool, and I loved every minute of it. Stopping was a treat too. I was a fad kid growing up, so I loved all that gas station delight food, and we got a lot to eat. Chips, jerky, soda, gut bomb burgers, all of it. Other times we would stop at nicer hotels, and this would prompt my dad to seek out nicer restaurants for us to eat at. It was a cool dichotomy, and seemed to satisfy both of us. There was one night that we rolled into some mid-sized town, and I can't remember the name of it. Litchfield or Litchbrook, something like that. This was one of the stops where we got a nice hotel room. We hit the pool, and then wandered around downtown a bit. I remember we were both gawking at all the ladies. Literally every single woman that we laid eyes on was prettier than the last. 
It's like there's something in the water out here, son. I remember my dad saying. You might be hitting the road on your own tomorrow. After a nice dinner and a walkabout, we decided to head back to the hotel room. I could tell something weird was going on right when I saw the place. There was this small crowd clustered around some cars that were parked funny. My dad didn't seem to bat an eye, didn't say anything about them, so I just kept on cruising too. I didn't want to seem like a big baby or anything, since I guess technically nothing was really going on, but still it was weird. I remember leaving a lingering eye on that crowd as I closed the door behind me and turned the deadbolt until it locked. We were on the ground floor, well, the whole hotel was, so it's not like it was super fancy or anything. It also didn't have any kind of great security. It was a standard hotel door, standard double locking system with a deadbolt and chain, a huge viewing window right by the door, and curtains pulled closed over it. Pretty typical. We settle in, and I start eating some peanut M&Ms. This was another staple for these road trips, as they were my dad's favorite candy. We were watching reruns of Seinfeld when I heard the first few shouts come from outside. I turned and peeked, but Dad just kept watching TV. The guy seemed unshakable. You think they're just drunk out there or something? I asked. It's none of our business, was all Dad said. I nodded and felt like I learned a valuable life lesson there. By the time it hit 9 p.m., we were both pretty beat, so decided to turn in for the night. The riffraff outside seemed to have settled down, and we wanted to get out of town by 6 or 7 a.m. to stay on schedule, so trying to pass out just made sense. We did our bathroom ritual and then promptly went to bed. I didn't fall asleep though. You see, my dad has this magical ability to be able to fall asleep anywhere, at any time, no matter what's going on. He was snoring loud as hell, and outside I could hear those voices getting louder again. My anxiety was further amplified by the fact that I was alone, or at least the only one awake. It just makes things that much worse when you're the only one privy to what is actually happening. Outside it sounded like your pretty average tailgate party. After listening in for a bit, something changed though. Instead of cheering and vibing, it sounded like voices were getting heated, agitated. I kept checking the clock. Around 10.30 the agitation started, and by 11.30, the guys were full on shouting at each other. I could hear a few people trying to mediate, but whatever was happening was quickly getting out of hand. Out of nowhere, the snoring stopped. My dad popped out of bed. He pulled a shirt on and moved to the window, peeked through the blinds. I had my eyes cracked open so I could see his expression. He kept a perfect poker face, just observing whatever was going on out there. My dad was a former Marine. And honestly, we had all heard rumors at family reunions and our get-togethers that in his youth, he'd beat a man to death during a bar fight then fled town right after. Lack of evidence kept him from ever going to prison. What's going on out there, Dad? I asked. Just a bunch of drunks, was his retort. Dad had also been sober for a couple of years, had a particular disdain for those that got drunk in public. He was a tight ass, is what I'm saying. And now a bunch of strangers had woken him up dead of the night. Any fear I had quickly dissolved. The voices got louder and louder outside and my dad didn't really miss a beat. He pulled on a pair of shorts and his shoes and started for the door. There's a gun underneath my pillow, he said. Keep an eye out and don't open up the door for anyone. With that, my dad disappeared into the darkness. I hopped out of bed and immediately shouldered up to the window. It had one of those big heavy curtains draped in front of it, the kind that could pass for a comforter. I peeled back one edge and looked out with a single eye. I had nailed those sounds that I was hearing earlier. It was a little tailgate party in the far parking lot of the hotel. One of the trucks seemed to be for the road company of some kind, like highway maintenance or something. It had cones and stuff in the back, and one big decal on the side. Definitely a work truck. My dad approached these guys from the shadows. He skulked around the side of the building and stuck to hard to see places. Only once he was pretty much on top of them did he step out and make his presence known. The crowd flinched at first, then turned and got somewhat silent. I couldn't hear the words, but Dad was moving as he spoke, motioning to the hotel room and then his car. Everyone nodded along, then he said goodnight. Dad always gave off this cop energy, so people usually listened to him. He came back to the room, 
slipped the key in, and then sat on the bed. So much for a decent night's sleep, he said, checking his phone. You should try to get a little more rest. Everything should be good now, son. And I did. I was tired as hell from the drive and sitting up all night. It was well past midnight at this point. My eyes were burning. But with the brief silence and security of my dad, I slipped off into nothingness. I don't know for how long, but what felt like just seconds later, I was shocked awake by a pounding on the door. I remember what my dad said in the moment, don't open the door for anyone. But for some reason, I had it in my head that he was still outside. That no time had gone by at all, and I'd just fallen asleep while he was having his first little conversation with them out there. I hopped up in a panic and rushed for the door, only to feel a heavy hand come down on my shoulder. Startled, I whirled around, and there was my dad, sitting on the edge of his bed. We're all here, we're all good, he assured me. Just that nonsense outside. He was projecting confidence, but I could tell my dad was a little rattled. Maybe he'd been sleeping too, and now he didn't know what was going on. Whoever was out the door kept banging and started to holler throughout the walls. Help me! Please! You gotta let me in! Beyond that, we could hear voices from earlier, closing in on the room. Dad took his pistol and went to the window, took a peek and didn't like what he saw. The guy caught a glimpse of him through the glass, started banging on the window, begging and pleading for us to open up the door. Please, man, they're gonna kill me out here, please! Why? What'd you do? My dad shouted through the glass. He turned to me and pointed to his phone. He told me to call 911. Any kind of talk about death was reason to have cops on sight. I grabbed his phone, but in my stupid kid confidence, I dialed 911 but didn't hit the call button. I got off the bed and went to my dad's side and looked out. There was a small mob coming up from behind this guy. Those people from earlier. I looked at the guy at the door and I didn't really recognize him. He was dressed different from everyone else. That's when I noticed that logo on his clothing. It was the same as the work truck in the corner of the parking lot. Dad, I, I think that's his truck, I said pointing. What are you saying? He asked me. As quickly as I could, I tried to explain what was running through my mind. This guy was just trying to get to his work truck when the drunk people decided to mess with him. I didn't know if I was actually right, but in the moment it kind of made sense to me. My dad pointed to the guy who was about to start kicking in our door and hollered out a question. Is that your truck out there? Yes. My dad took a sharp breath through his teeth, unbolted the lock and swung the door open. He didn't let the guy come inside, just stood right in his way. He brought the pistol up to eye level and let everyone outside get a good look at it too. The guy still tried to barrel inside the room, but dad stayed firm in his way. I just called the police shouted over the voices. That seemed to get everyone's attention pretty quickly. That's when I realized I never dialed it. But seeing everyone tuck their tail and start to leave, I figured it was all over. The guy at our door collapsed against the exterior wall and started explaining everything. He was staying a couple of doors down. He'd been out having a few beers when he made the walk back to the hotel. Right away, he noticed the commotion around his truck. That being said that he was in town to finish a job, he didn't want anything happening to his equipment. He said he made a simple request for them to please get away from his vehicle. The crowd had been boozed up at this point, and so was that roadway worker. What started as a question quickly turned into a barking match. The solo guy was severely outgunned. One push led to another. Soon the guy was surrounded. He said he squared up and swung his way out of the circle, but they laid a pretty good beating on him. It was obvious. His room key fell out of his pocket during the scuffle. He just went door to door, begging for help while these people chased him around. Well, at least that was the partial story. The overnight clerk saw some of the incident from his office, and he really did call the cops. They dropped in out of nowhere, just like my dad. His cruisers rolled into the parking lot, even without so much as headlights on, let alone a siren. They corralled anyone who hadn't already fled, then the real story came out. It turned out the roadway worker had been having some beers at a nearby bar, but so had that entire crowd. Words were exchanged before finally the bartender kicked them all out. As they wandered the streets talking trash, they recognized the guy's truck in the hotel parking lot. They went and bought a case of beer, then literally tailgated on the guy's truck until he showed up, 
just so that they could have that final word. Again, the solo guy started clashing with the group, only to realize there weren't any bouncers to protect him anymore. Next thing he knows, he's banging on a stranger's door, begging for help. When the law showed up, things got real quiet. People scattered and those who didn't were detained and questioned. Dad and I didn't have to give a statement. And since I wasn't the one who called the police, we just shut the door and got back in bed. The only person that must have got arrested was that roadway worker. His truck was still in the parking lot the next morning when we left. I'm an amateur photographer and I have an obsession with nature. This means I love to take stills and action shots of landscapes, as well as lengthy long exposure shots. Rivers, eagles over lakes, overhead lunar panoramas. I'm not a professional by any means, but I have a love for trying my hand at different types of photography. There was a time where I was obsessed with getting these perfect shots of a lightning bolt. I'd seen all these cool collections of totally insane shots. Bolts spider webbing out of a single point, only to go and fill the entire frame. And of course, the cool shots where a single bolt would stretch an unbelievable length across the frame. These pictures are pretty common on Facebook and Instagram nowadays, and I'm sure you've seen what I'm talking about. My friend and I set out on a road trip to go capture one of these shots for ourselves. We did our research, found out where a lot of these photos were being taken. All across the Southwest, there's a time of the year called monsoon, where catastrophic rain can stretch for hundreds of miles. During these bouts of heavy precipitation, the energy builds up in the clouds and makes for tremendous thunder and lightning. We set sail for the most southwestern place that I could imagine, Four Corners, USA. This is where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado all come together in the most perfect symmetry. It's the only place you can be in four states at once. I didn't really care about any of that. I was just reading online that this was a supreme area for lightning photography during monsoon and would allow me to chase storms into any of these states. I might catch one of these awesome shots that I was looking for. I planned the trip out with a friend of mine. Oh, and full disclosure, we're both women. Cass was a yes girl, always opting to come along on my impromptu photo shoots. And this was the longest ride for us yet, which probably only amplified her desire to go. If I was the amateur photographer, Cass was the stand-in model. We hit the road with a mixed variety of supplies. Obviously, all of my photography equipment, as well as our normal clothes. But then we had a bunch of random props, as well as costumes and accessories for Cass to play around with. She liked to create little narratives within some of our photo series, which was really artsy and unique. We also had some random camping gear, just in case we ran out of money or there wasn't any hotels nearby. We wanted to be prepared for anything, which, looking back, was honestly a pretty tall order. Two young ladies traveling solo across half the country to a destination literally in the middle of nowhere. You do the math. Either way, we set sail and had zero issues. The weather was good, at least while we were driving, though, and the car was cruising just fine. We rolled over multiple state lines, even attended a random concert that I got some cool film of before we finally make it into Colorado. We overnighted in Trinidad before making the last jaunt of the trip the next morning. An absolute beautiful southern drive that took us through the towns like Durango and Cortez. It was some of the most storybook driving that I've still done to this day. Then we dropped into the rolling badlands that connected these four rugged states. We couldn't have struck better timing either. Cass and I could actually see the clouds building up in the distance vaguely in the direction of our destination. Damn, we nailed it, Cass screamed at the windshield. We start rolling our windows down and we're met with the warm, heavy air that comes with the monsoons. The humidity and pressure bubble up until it forces the clouds to dump all the moisture back into the ground below. I guess it pays to do your own research, I said. Remember, we had spent a couple of months planning out this entire trip so it's not like we were showing up completely blind. Up ahead, we watched as the clouds built up to a towering black form. It looked like something out of a movie, like there should have been a volcano nearby, spewing lava and smoke in every direction. As we got closer, I'll never forget this. 
Cass and I could literally feel the electricity in the air. The hairs on our arms and legs started to stand up. There was like static nearby, but it was all just energy from the clouds. Even the hair on our heads started to stand upright as we closed in on the Four Corners Visiting Center. I don't know what the place normally looks like, but when we rolled up, it was turning into a ghost town. The rain hadn't started yet, but the darkness and icy winds were running all the tourists back into their cars. When we first pulled in, there were probably 30 people or so milling around, that same number of cars in the parking lot. By the time we got our coats and camera, half of them had retreated into their cars and were looking to get back on the highway and out of that storm. Still, there was a handful of souls meandering around the area, a couple of families here and there, a few older couples, and of course, the rogue soloists with cameras or just their phone. It was a tourist center, so it had an eclectic mismatch of people which I honestly never gave a thought to. Four Corners is a pretty desolate area, even for having that visiting center. It's just a couple of buildings, then a couple of stalls that have random information. Then there's this big concrete slab with series of circles in it, which outline where the state lines are and which state you are in as you pass through them. In the dead center was a place where a person could be in four states at once. So we got in the short line to take our photo. By the time we snapped our photographs, that storm was in full effect. The first raindrops fell, big fat ones that were inescapable. The few people that were left all went running for the parking lot. Cass and I were giggling, trying to keep our props and camera gear dry, when something shook us to our very core. That first big rumble of lightning, followed by a crazy streak of lightning right overhead. It was so close that we could feel it in the air, just like before. Cass and I immediately dumped into the front seat of my car and watched the water smatter against the glass. This was it. This is what we came for. We settled into the front seats, watched a row of glowing red tail lights drift off into the growing darkness. It was just the afternoon, but the storm blacked out any sign of daylight. It felt well into the evening, but we were energized, ready to take some cool photos. I remember we had the heater on full blast to keep the windows from fogging up, while we had a little bit of a snack and waited to see where the lightning would be at. It all seemed like it was coming from the northwest, out of Utah, but there also seemed to be a second storm blowing in from the south, or what looked like Arizona. Maybe that's why it's getting so crazy, I commented. It looks like two storms are coming together. Whatever the case, the downpour was torrential. As I looked out my window, I could see the vague outline of a car across the way. It looked like someone else was hanging out through the storm too. Just as I was getting ready to mention it, I saw the driver door swing open and a person jump out into the rain. Cass and I were both in disbelief. Who would be so bold as to run around in such a mess? The hard earth out there was rapidly turning into mud, and above, lightning threatened to reach out and touch anyone that dared it. Still, we were a little jealous. It was the exact kind of behavior that we were always trying to emulate. Carefree attitude, chill vibes, young and wild, all that crap. Well, naturally we started hyping each other up, itching to throw open our doors and just run out into the rain. It wasn't going to take much, as we wanted to cut loose while the storm was still going. Just as I started to open up the door, Cass grabbed me and told me to wait. Why? I asked. Look she said, nodding through her window. Outside, we could see the phantom form of a stranger starting to take their clothes off. We hadn't been sure if the driver was a man or a woman before, but now it was obvious that it was a man. He tore off his shirt, whirled it around over his head before letting it fly off a good 20 feet. He started running around after that, literally prancing and skipping in every direction. As he moved around, he lost more and more clothing until he was completely naked. Our giggles stopped as we watched in sick horror as this guy splashed in the puddles, rolled in the mud, tried to catch the rain in his hands. I don't know why, but we were just both super creeped out. Watching him in secret made it feel even weirder, like we had front row tickets to this guy's weird private life. Then he started coming over to the car. It wasn't direct at first, but once he closed in, the movement was unmistakable. He made a circle around the whole vehicle before coming up to the passenger window, cupping his hands and peering inside. Cass was on that side of the car. 
she squeezed all the way over to the center console and into my seat. I don't know when it started, but all of a sudden, the car was filled with screaming. The guy looked on in surprise at first, then joy. He smiled and waved, then started tugging on the handle. Thank God that it was locked. They all were. But that didn't stop the guy from going door to door and trying to open up every single handle. He even tried the trunk. When that didn't work, he started whooping up to the sky. At that point, I'd had enough. I fired up the engine and shifted into reverse. I started turning back for the exit. With all the mud, potholes, and lack of visibility throughout the windshield, I could only go five or six miles per hour. This weirdo was still running laps around us, and he had no issue keeping up. He gave up after about a half a mile, just simply turned around and jogged back towards the parking lot to the heart of the storm. To this day, we still have no idea who that guy was or what he was doing. He was a clean cut looking white guy, maybe 25 at the oldest. Looked like a pretty average dude, short of the naked harassment. Cass and I found a pullout a few miles of where we collected ourselves, made sure the car was okay. He never came up driving behind us, so we got the photos that we came for, then headed back towards Durango. If you decide to visit Four Corners, look out for the crazy naked rain dance man. My best friend and I planned a legendary road trip the summer of our senior year. We had just graduated and finished up four years of all kinds of commitments, not just school, but sports. Also, extracurricular clubs, student council, all kinds of things. We were very busy students, had an overwhelming desire to just cut loose that last year. We also had kind of developed a weird kind of FOMO. We watched everyone have the craziest time of their lives throughout their senior year. So when it came time for our turn, we were ready. The only thing we hadn't accounted for was another friend that was coming along, a guy named Jackson. We'd been on and off friends with for many, many years. He had moved away once, gone through this religious awakening, and then turned into kind of an asshole. There was also something always coming up in his life that was preventing him from hanging out with us. Senior year though, we were buds, and Jackson wanted to come on the road trip with us. Ever Jackson and I hit the road that summer and never looked back. We were blasting out the Midwest and shooting for the coast. We wanted to see as much as we could before we hit the beach. Four Corners, the Pueblo ruins in Colorado, the rock formations in Utah, the Grand Canyon, even if we could squeeze it in. The end goal was to crash land in the Monterey area, anywhere in the seaside, and just live in beach cruise as bums for a week or so. We planned the whole thing to take 14 days total, including six days of just drive time. By and large, everything was perfect for the moment that we set sail. The weather was beautiful, gas was affordable, and there really wasn't anything holding us back. We listened to some of our favorite music, told funny stories, and saw the familiar sights of our state. As we drifted closer and closer to the state line, things started to look different, new, and we got excited. So excited that I don't think we ever stopped that first night. We just took turns driving straight through until we were way ahead of schedule and just beyond exhaustion. The next morning we corrected ourselves, got a hotel and slept like we never had before. We bit off a little more than we could chew pretty much right away. So this helped us keep a much more responsible tone the rest of the trip. Keep it simple and that way, keep it enjoyable. Lessons to live by, man. The trip went pretty much exactly to plan. Fast forward five days, we're floating through the inland California, through some of the sketchiest and dumpiest towns that I've ever seen in my life. Evers said he had family in towns like those, so he had memories of going to visit from his childhood. It was crazy to see the amount of homeless and the urban decay. That stuff aside, it was even crazier to see people making their daily commutes throughout these areas like this, like it was totally normal. Honestly, I couldn't believe it. It was like something out of a dystopian novel. As we were rolling out of these towns, we started to see drifters here and there, mostly in the way of very discreet hitchhikers. We were young. We'd heard rumors that some states didn't allow hitchhikers. For whatever reason, that was a point of conversation throughout the drive. Something had flipped inside of me after seeing so much crazy poverty. Being young and on the road, 
and sympathetic, I secretly wanted to give a hitchhiker a ride. It sounded cool, exciting, and of course, generous for their situation. It was just one of those milestones of youth that I wanted to tick off, so I floated it out to my buddies. Hey guys, what if we picked up the next drifter that we passed? I asked from the passenger seat. Eva was behind the wheel, and Jackson was sprawled out in the back. Haven't you ever seen that movie? Jackson asked from the back. Uh, which one? I asked. Uh, you know, man. Jackson fumbled. I don't know what it's called, but it's the one where they pick up a hitchhiker, and it kills everyone in the car with a knife. Uh, it's called Hitchhiker, Eva said. Yeah, that one, Jackson yelled. We both just laughed up in the front. Jackson was always trying to make what he considered obvious, logical conclusions, but he never actually knew what he was talking about. It was hilarious and always made for a good chuckle, even if it was at his expense. No one's gonna kill us, dude, Eva said. I picked up hitchhikers before. Nothing ever happened. It was his car, and he had family all over, so it was a little more well-traveled than either of us. Okay, do whatever you want then. Jackson said, spreading out back in the back. Just remember what I said. With that, he fell asleep, or at least pretended to. Eva and I took to looking along the road, shopping for an average looking person to offer a ride to. We honestly passed a couple of dudes that were pretty mangy and scary looking, so we blew on right by. We were kids. We didn't want to land ourselves in a situation that we couldn't handle. We wanted to do something different shake up the miles for a bit and something generous for people that needed help then we saw him then we saw him he was just a mile or two beyond the town limits hanging out just off the shoulder smoking a cigarette he was younger probably our age looked edgy as hell i'm talking bright bleached hair and that stuck out in every direction painted fingernails baggy jeans and a skin tight t-shirt he had a duffel bag sitting on the flaking asphalt right next to him uh, what about that dude? I asked. Yeah, that, that looks like the right guy. Eva said with a nod. He braked and then started to pull onto the side of the road. The guy up ahead didn't miss a beat, shouldered his bag and started walking over the moment the passenger tire rolled over that white line. He didn't even want to size us up before he hopped inside, and for some reason, that told me he has to be harmless. If you had ill intent, wouldn't you want to see who was in the car first? It could be a bunch of kids, or it could be a bunch of cops or bikers or some other equally dangerous group of people, but this kid didn't bat an eye. Holy shit, are you serious? Jackson asked from the back, swinging his legs around and getting behind the driver's seat. We're really picking this dude up? Yep, at least until we hit the next city, I said. And just then, he popped open the door and dropped in. He set his bag between himself and Jackson. Hey, thanks for the ride. My name's Croy Scashley. It's nice to meet you guys. That is bar for bar what he said. It's even his real name. I doubt this guy has social media of any kind, if he's even still alive. We went around the car and gave our brief introductions. We told him where we were from and our goal for that trip. He was all ears, cheering on everything we said. Roy even told us he'd give us some pointers and directions to cool things once we got closer to the beach. He's lived in California his whole life. So we switched up, and he told us about himself. He was born in San Diego, where his parents still lived, but he'd been drifting around for about five years at this point. He dropped out of school and spent six months chasing different bands around the state, couch surfing and sleeping in burned out parking structures. He'd gotten hooked on drugs somewhere in there, and that's when time really started to go by. He went back home a few times and tried to get cleaned up, but now that he'd lived on the road, it called to him all the time. Croy was currently traveling to see a friend that he heard was in the hospital. It seemed like a noble errand for such a vagrant. You guys mind if I smoke in here? He asked. Eva and I shared a look. It was his car, so I didn't really have a say. There's no ashtray, Jackson said from the back the voice of reason. Oh, aren't you done with this? Croy asked, shaking an empty Coke bottle. I figured I'd just ash him in here. Uh, none of us smoke, man. 
Eva ventured. Come on, man, Croy shouted. It all kind of caught us off guard. I'll put the window down, dude. You stopped and picked me up when I was smoking a cigarette, literally right in front of you. You guys knew I smoked. Quit busting my balls, damn. And with that, he dropped the window and fired up a smoke. Eva just kind of shrugged. The guy did make a good point, and honestly, it's not like the car was brand new or anything. So, Croy just smoked at his own discretion the whole rest of the afternoon. We picked him up around noon or one. The next city would come up around 7 p.m. Long before that, though, we passed through another small town that had this gas station and a restaurant, maybe 50 houses scattered in the dirt. There was this nice old hotel, too, but it was weird. For some reason, it just gave me the heebie-jeebies. I remembered it had red felt carpet outside the room, like a long patio walkway. It was very dated and very creepy. We briefly stopped in this town just to get a little gas and stretch our legs. I'm gassing up the car. Jackson is inside taking a piss, and Ever is wandering around in circles, trying to loosen up his knees. Croy stayed in the car, kind of talking to himself, but it could have been to us, we just didn't hear him. When we got done getting gas, Jackson had just returned from the bathroom, so we all did kind of a bitch switcheroo. Eva and I headed inside now that Jackson was back with the car. We both had to pee, and both wanted to get something to drink. So after we did our thing, we both then headed back to the car. The second we step outside, we could hear a shouting match, and it takes us minutes to realize that it's coming from our car. We start rushing over and see the back passenger door open. Croy still sitting down and laughing, Jackson standing over him and shouting. Yo, what's the deal? I asked. This guy pinched me, dude, Jackson said, showing me his arm. I wanted to laugh at first, but sure enough, there was this big red raspberry on the inside of his arm. I shook my head and looked over to Ever, who was kind of in charge of this whole thing. I looked up to him like an older brother, so whatever he said, I was probably going to go with. Why would you do that? Ever asked. Come on, I was just messing with him, Roy explained. He leaned up against the window, and I pinched him. I figured it'd scare the hell out of him. So... Is that your version of a joke? I asked. Sure, was his response. Then he started cackling like crazy, fired up another cigarette, closed his door, and then nodded for us to get inside. All three of us turned to each other. I am not riding with him, Jackson said. I don't want to leave him out here, Eva said. Let's just drop him off when he get to the city. He'll probably tuck and roll before we even stop. I'll sit in the back with him, I offered to Jackson. He looked down and molded over before shrugging and then getting into the passenger seat. You guys remember what I told you? Do you remember? He asked. We both nodded and got in the car. Oh, a little switch up. Got you all scared, do I? Roy asked as I sat next to him. Uh, he just wants some more room. He's taller than me, I explained. For the next few minutes, I just talked to Croy, and I mean really got engaged with him. We started talking about politics, and then time, and we just barely pulled out of the parking lot at this point. This was more than the vibe that I had in mind when I wanted to pick up a hitchhiker. Just talk about some crazy stuff, hang out, whatever. As I'm telling him some of my theories about dark matter, I see Croy do a double take out the window. We're at a small intersection, just getting ready to jump back on the interstate. There's a different hitchhiker standing out there with a sign, a dog, and all of his belongings. I expected Croy to maybe wave or offer a couple of bucks out the window. Anything to lend a hand to a support a fellow wayward traveler, right? Instead, what I see is Croy's hand slip up around his Coke bottle ashtray before he throws it as hard as he can at the guy by the road. He actually had to jump out of the way to avoid getting smashed by it. Croy then proceeds to lean out the window and scream a bunch of insults at the guy and his dog, purely just for standing there. Now what the hell was that all about? I asked him, once he slumped back into the seat. We were on the highway and gaining speed to leave the whole scene behind. Gotta look out for these punks on the road, man. It's dog eat dog and everyone is out to get you, he explained. He's just trying to feed his dog, I said, and he interrupted me. 
It's not about that guy. It's not personal. It's just the very notion. Living on the road is chaos by definition. The best thing that we can do is keep each other on our toes. I'm looking out for the guy, really. You just wouldn't understand. It turned out Croy was full of inconsistencies, a walking contradiction, so to speak. If he said left, he would turn right, if you catch my drift. Suddenly, the depth of whatever we were talking about just didn't seem genuine, like everything he said was just coming out of nowhere. I watched as his legs became restless, his hands started shaking, even as we talked, and he became more and more irritable, chain-smoking cigarettes at this point. I need to buy some more smokes, he said. He said at one point, as the sun was starting to dip down. No one responded because, frankly, no one really cared. It was like 5 p.m. and there wasn't anything in sight. We wouldn't come upon a store or a gas station until we hit the outer limits of the city. And that's where we would be stopping for the night. Hey, let's stop so I can get some cigarettes. There's not a gas station for 90 miles, dude. Look around you, Jackson said. I am looking around me, and I can see a bunch of losers, Roy shot back. Then full bore slapped Eva in the ear. The car squealed off the road and then onto the shoulder before he corrected it and got us back on the highway. I jumped into action at this point, as I said in the beginning. Ever is my best friend. I slammed Croy into the door and tied up his arms as best I could. He was a skinny little runt, but honestly, he had that wiry tweaker muscle that you could see sometimes. I could feel his arms and legs rippling just under mine, trying to find a weakness. Look, man, I tried to explain. You do anything like that again, I'm going to yank open this door and let you hit the highway at about 80 miles an hour. You ready to be a layer of paint people are driving through? Oh, we're cool, man, we're cool, he said. But still, I could feel his fingers looking for a way out. And I didn't take my hand off the door handle. Everything settled down for real. We just sat quietly through the last stretch of the drive. Roy started asking us about our trip again, trying to be normal and give us advice on where to go. But now, none of us were interested. We focused on the music and talked to each other a little bit. He just leaned against the window and stared out in the passing desert. Eventually, a gas station came into view, the first signs of the city. We had a hotel room pre-booked by our parents waiting for us and knew exactly where we were going. Hey, look, cigarettes. Can we stop? Roy asked. Sure, Eva said. We were all a little surprised. He pulled off the highway and cruised into the parking lot. Just a minute, you, you guys want anything? I shook my head. See if they got Yoohoo, the chocolate drink, Eva said. I had never even seen him drink Yoohoo in his entire life. Croy nodded and walked for the store. What do you guys think? Let's leave him here, right? Eva said, the second the guy was out of earshot. Yeah, this guy's fucking crazy, dude. Let's get out of here, Jackson confirmed. I looked out the window a bit in shock. Were we really about to do that? Just burn out of here and leave this guy stranded? When I thought about it, though, he was stranded to begin with. He was always going to be stranded. We'd done our part and got him to his next destination, the city with the hospital where he was supposed to meet up with his friend. Yep, I said. Let's get to the hotel before he catches us. Eva burned out of there like it was Grand Theft Auto. Didn't even stop at the red light just to make sure that we were well down the road by the time Croy came out of that gas station. The last thing that we needed was him chasing us down the road. It wasn't until we got a mile or two that we realized that we still had his duffel bag. I looked down and got this sick sour feeling in my stomach. I pulled it over and set it on the seat next to me. It felt wet, damp. It was heavy too and it smelled like mildew. Worse even. Hey, we got Croy's stuff back here, I said. Are you serious? Why didn't you toss it out in the parking lot? Jackson asked. I don't know. I didn't see it. Eva immediately hit his blinker and started to turn around. I'm down to leave this guy, but I'm not stealing his stuff, he explained. He and Jackson started to argue a bit, and I just relaxed in the back. All this crap was out of my control. It had been like nine hours in the car that day. I just wanted to sleep in a bed. Whatever they decided was fine by me, as long as we didn't let that dude back in the car. He was a seriously disturbed guy. Then it occurred to me I could rifle through his stuff and not have any consequences. 
I unzipped the bag and got more questions than answers. The first thing that I noticed was all the underwear. It was like 20 pairs of women's panties. I couldn't tell if they were clean or not. They seemed to be all kinds of various sizes, and I'm just assuming that they were stolen. There was a book by Albert Camus, which had a partial sheet of acid stored inside. There was also a bag of what looked like to be cocaine, and get this, a full pack of cigarettes. Why he wanted to stop was beyond us. There was a little more spooky stuff too. A real pair of metal handcuffs with a small key, a really big combat knife, and a single change of what looked like normal clothes. I didn't dig much deeper than that. Everything was really gross and I could tell that we were coming back up on the gas station. I told them what I found and they all got a little bit concerned. But as we pulled in, we could see Croy was waiting for us. He was waiting against the building smoking a cigarette, just like we found him earlier. Ever rolled through the lot and tossed the bag out the window. Croy gave us the finger and then we got back on course for the hotel. The rest of the night went pretty normal. We got some dinner at a cool pizza place just down the road, even found an arcade, then went back to the hotel to crash. We parked around back just to keep the car off the street and out of view for anyone walking by. The next morning though, I woke up before Jackson and Ever. I was getting myself together when I realized I left my bathroom bag in the car. I slipped on my shoes and went out only to see a bunch of papers tucked under the windshield and cigarette butts all over the ground. I got up to the car and the pages were out of that book in Croy's bag, some old French philosophy book. From what I could tell, Croy had found our car and just hung out all night in it. I don't know if he was waiting for us or just wanted to make a point, but it rattled us to the core that next morning. I was certain that he was hiding somewhere, just waiting to step out and catch us off guard. We got ourselves together and literally skipped town. We were all really scared at that point. This guy had the advantage of knowing the city. We were just operating on Google Map printouts. Thankfully, we never ran into him again. You better believe that we were on our toes the rest of that trip. If Croy Scashley hears this, sorry for stealing your stuff, dude. <laughs>